It was two weeks ago, Tom and I went up Mount Veritat, and the memory still got me more messed up than a Central Park squirrel. I got into wild camping when I was a kid. I'm in my mid-thirties now and my passion for the outdoors hasn't diminished in the slightest. Neither has my friend Tom's, whom I've known since childhood. We've spent many summers exploring the vast wilderness of Wisconsin together. Tom had taken a break for a few years, but since he was back in town after trying and failing to set up roots in New York, he was itching to get out to the mountains. It's not the most dangerous hobby for sure, but it does come with risks. Enough to make it always feel like an adventure, you know. We had encountered our fair share of bears, bobcats, and even a cougar. Both me and Tom had broken bones falling. We had even done a couple of minimal provision of roughing it traps. Point being, when I say there was nothing that we could have done differently, that would mean Tom is still alive. You can also sure as heck believe me when I tell you camping, it turns out, is one of the most ball-clenching, terrifying ways to spend a weekend, and it can mess you up like nothing else. Honestly, if you've ever been considering taking it up, don't. After what happened two weeks ago, I can say with certainty that you're safer dabbling in nefarious activities instead. On this particular occasion, we had set our sights on conquering Mount Veritat, a mountain that towered over the surrounding landscape, its peak shrouded in an ethereal mist. The weather that Saturday was supposed to be great though, crisp and clear, a perfect weekend to take some tents and a big old bag of weed deep into the Wisconsin wilderness and help Tom forget about Felicia. The trail up the mountain was treacherous, with steep inclines and rocky terrain that tested our endurance and resolve. But we were determined to reach the summit and bask in the glory of our achievement. As evening approached, we set up camp on a small plateau overlooking the valley below. The moon was full, casting a soft glow over the surrounding forest and illuminating the rugged terrain. The air was still and cool, and the silence of the wilderness was broken only by the crackling of the campfire and the occasional hoot of an owl. As we sat by the campfire, enjoying the ridiculously high-grade lemon haze, we reminisced about old times and planned for future adventures, now that Tom was no longer tied down. We had just finished an absolute cannon of a blunt, soaking in the beauty of the night sky. The stars twinkled like diamonds, and the moon was so bright that we could let the fire dwindle to embers and could still see enough to take a leak in the bush without getting any of it on our boots. A good night, you know. I'm glad we got one last one together before Tom. Anyway, as I said earlier, weather forecast for the weekend had been good. We had been back in my place, playing Left 4 Dead on the same Xbox 360 that we had sunk hours into in middle school, if it hadn't been set to be a clear one. We enjoy the outdoors, but we're not crazy. We were all set and expecting clear views and the welcoming, crisp weather that makes you feel lucky to live in Wisconsin. But as the night deepened, a thick fog began to roll in, obscuring the moon and shrouding the campsite in an eerie mist. The trees loomed like dark sentinels in the mist, their branches creaking and rustling in the wind. The fire flickered and danced, casting strange shadows on the ground. With each moment there passed, the fog grew denser, thicker, until it became almost oppressive, clinging to our skin and clothes like a damp and cold blanket. It was as if the mist had a presence beyond the physical, a malevolent force that seeped into our bones and made us shiver for more than the wet chill of it. The smell was the worst part. It was a horrid, rotten stench that hung heavy in the air, making us gag with every breath. It was as if something had died and was decomposing just out of sight, emitting its putrid odor into the night. The mist itself was a sickly gray color, like the color of decaying flesh. 
It swirled and eddied, creating strange, ghostly shapes and shadows that seemed to move independently of the mist itself. It was as if the fog was alive, a sentient entity that was watching us with malevolent intent. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end as I realized that there was something deeply unsettling about this mist. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were not alone in the wilderness that night, and that whatever was out there was not friendly. I voiced my concerns to Tom, and he remarked that it was a really good weed that I had brought, and I was just about to retort that I don't think any lemon haze this far east of Cali had enough TH sing to prank me out this hard when we had heard it. A rustling in the bushes nearby caught our attention. We both froze, unsure of what to expect. Was it a wild animal or just a harmless critter? We cautiously peered into the darkness but couldn't see anything. We shrugged it off, assuming it was just the wind or a small animal scurrying about. Probably wasn't scurrying though, thinking about it. It was probably running for its life. Funny how hindsight changes your perspective, ain't it? The smell didn't leave and neither did the paranoia that Tom was convinced could be put down to too much smoke. Definitely enough to make us call it there and pick up the good times again tomorrow though. The vibe was totally killed. As we prepared to turn in for the night... I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that had settled over me. The mist had somehow grown even thicker, and visibility had all but gone. Time passing since my last blunt made the unshakable edginess worse, not better too. We crawled into our tents, zipping them up tight to keep out the damp chill of the fog, and I could tell that Tom was feeling it, just as I was despite his bravado. Lying there in the darkness, I listened to the sounds of the night. The wind howled through the trees, and the branches creaked and groaned as if in protest. We had camped these mountains dozens of times. I didn't get spooked by nature. My own fear was making me fearful for no reason other than it being so alien. It was that mist. I couldn't get it out of my head or nostrils. It's like it and the smell that hung on it like a gallows victim, left to swing in the sun for a week, seemed to seep into the tent, muffling all sound and suffocating me in its clammy embrace. Despite my unease, I eventually drifted off to sleep, my dreams filled with strange and unsettling images that, thank God, were succubed from my memory the moment my eyes had opened. The troubled rest was short-lived too, as a sudden noise jolted me awake. I sat up, heart pounding, and peered through the foggy tent flap into the darkness. And that's when I saw it. It took me a few seconds to realize my eyes had even honed in on a form, but once it dawned on me that they had, I couldn't ignore it. There was something out there miles away, a shape carved against the jagged mountain peaks that shouldn't be stood amongst them. Something was moving in the mist, a dark shape that seemed to be coming toward Mount Veritat. Something as vast as it was distant. A nondescript shadow barely distinguishable within and against the thick fog and rolling midnight clouds. I couldn't make out what it was and I even thought at the time that it was probably just a trick of the absent light. But the fear that gripped me was all too real. And then just as suddenly as it had appeared, the shape had vanished into the mist. It left something in its wake though. Soft rumbling bass tone in the air. A steady thumping almost like the slow heartbeat of some deep sea leviathan. I frantically shook Tom awake, whispering urgently to him to be quiet and to listen. We sat there in the darkness holding our breath and straining to hear any sound there was nothing, only the rustling of the wind and the creaking of the trees. We sat for what felt like an eternity, waiting for another sound, but there was none. Eventually, we felt sheepish and started laughing nervously, trying to convince ourselves that it was just our imagination playing tricks on us. 
We settled back down into our sleeping bags, ready to drift off again. But just as we were about to succumb to sleep, there was a loud boom that shook the earth beneath us, and then another and another, as if some prehistoric monstrosity had clawed its way out of the annals of ultra-antiquity to stalk the landscape once more. We leapt out of our tents, the fear that had gripped us earlier returning with a vengeance. The mist had grown so thick it felt like it was basically a liquid while we slept, and we emerged from the tent to find that we could barely see a few inches in front of us. We stumbled around in inky, fetid air, trying to swivel our ears to the source of the noise and impending danger. But there was nothing, only the crushing dread and the stench of the fog. I was about to yell to Tom that we needed to run when as soon as it had started, the booming had stopped. For a few eye of the storm moments, there was silence and stillness. But then Tom let out a half panicked, half excited yell. He said that he saw something in the far distance, a light that flickered and danced in the darkness. I asked him what he was talking about and he started babbling about, and I kid you not, a UFO. Sky lanterns, he said, a pair of them, bobbing around nothing like a plane or a chopper would, but it was too far away to be sure. Without warning, he ran off into the fog, leaving me alone in the darkness. I stood there, paralyzed with by the unhealthy injection of inexplicability and unfamiliarity into our trip, unsure of what to do. The silhouette that we had seen earlier loomed large in my mind, and Tom's talk of UFOs after a succession of artillery-like booms didn't help assuage the fixation at all. Did I want to run, to grab my flashlight and head down Mount Veritat as fast as my butt could carry me? You're right that I did. That's all I wanted to do. But unfortunately, I'm not that kind of guy. I wouldn't leave Tom alone in the fog. And so I set off after him, stumbling blindly through the mist. My heart was pounding in my chest, and my breath came in short, ragged gasps. I called out to him, but there was no response. And then I heard the sound of running water a rushing stream that cut through the darkness. I followed the sound, my feet slipping on the wet stones beneath me. And then, through the mist, I saw it. A vast silhouette looming in the darkness, cut into focus only briefly by a lightning flash of these sky lanterns that Tom had followed. The shape of it indistinct, menacing, and most harrowing of all, impossible to deny the existence of. It towered over me, seeming to stretch up into the very heavens, the peak of it obscured by the twin flares, just emerged from above the cloud canopy to illuminate it. Before I could whip the beam of my flashlight around to console myself, with lies about my mind playing tricks on me though, I vanished into the mist, leaving me once again alone in my now piss-soaked pants. I stood there, trembling with fear and sure of what to do, and then I heard Tom's voice calling out to me from somewhere in the distance. I stumbled through the mist toward him, my heart pounding in my chest. When I finally found him, he was standing on the edge of a cliff, peering out into the darkness. He said that he had caught a glimpse of something in the distance, a light that flickered and danced in the fog. Or that's how he described it at least. But when he ran toward it, it vanished into the mist. I didn't have to think long to put two and two together. I didn't know what was going on, but this thing Tom was so desperate to find, I was equally invested in getting away from. I tried in vain to convince him that no good could come of those skylights. To explain what I had witnessed before I had found him. To kill any wild panicked ideas about UFOs. But it was no use. We stood there arguing for it felt like hours. All the while waiting for something, anything to happen. There were no more quaking booms. 
no more sky lanterns descending from the clouds. The mist swirled around us and the darkness seemed to press in on us from all sides. The weirdness of Mount Veritet had lulled, and I had just about managed to convince Tom to head back to the tent. I had even managed to half convince myself that I had imagined the skyscraper-sized figure deep in the fog, that it had indeed been the product of some kind of weed-induced hallucination. Then it stood up. It towered over us, the cliff edge barely at waist height, the treetops of the evergreens below just about scraping its knees. Before, it had been far enough away that I only caught a fleeting glimpse of its silhouette. This close, the beams of our flashlights could unmask its form all in its abyssal glory. I knew instantly that we were in the presence of true horror. No mortal had the psychological resilience to truly comprehend. A creature that defied all logic and reason. A behemoth thing wearing the form of a blackened human skeleton, almost as if it existed to blasphemously mock the concept of life. Its skeletal frame easily stood hundreds of feet tall, towering over everything in its path. Its tree trunk, thick bones were gnarled and twisted, as if they had grown warped from years of abuse and neglect. Each was covered in a thick layer of dark, oily grime, as if it had been coated in the filth of the most degradation-ridden metropolis in human history. But it was the monster's eyes that robbed me of all hope in an instant. Despite its eyes and the nightmarish nature of its impossible frame, its eyes, the sky lantern and UFOs Tom had been chasing, glowed with an otherworldly light, casting an eerie sickly haze on everything around us as it bent its skull down toward the cliff edge. And the brightness that emanated from them was not the warm, comforting light of the sun, but a cold and sterile shimmer that seemed to drain some of the vibrancy, and for lack of a better term, the reality from all that it touched. And the creature was draped in what appeared to be a cloak at first, but as it lowered itself to us and got closer, I realized that it wasn't clothing. This abomination wore a perpetually cascading waterfall of murky, pungent water, a perpetual torrent of what I can only describe as sewer drainage, filled with debris, garbage, and human waste of all kinds. The river of filth evaporated to steam at the skeletal giant blacked bone feet billowing out into the world as a cloud of gaseous haze of rot and misery. The putrid stench that emanated from it was overwhelming, filling our nostrils and making us gag. It was as if the fog had been amplified a thousandfold, and I'm genuinely amazed and neither Tom or I choked. It was as if this being was a walking and breathing landfill, a monument to the waste and excess of humanity. As the monster crouched, the movements of its mammoth bony thighs alone was enough to leave destruction in its wake. The ground beneath its feet turned to black and withered, as if all the life had been sucked out of it. Trees and plants wilted and died, their leaves turning brown and crumbling to dust. It was as if the monster's very presence was toxic to the environment, a harbinger of death and decay. The necrotic, rotting giant let out a deafening roar that shook the very ground beneath us, and we could smell its putrid breath from where we stood. And then the monster did something that still makes me shudder to this day. It began to vomit. Oh God, the vomit. The black, slimy substance that the monster spewed forth was unlike anything that I had ever seen before. It was thick and viscous like tar, and it seemed to melt away everything in its path. The smell of it was overpowering, like a mixture of rotting flesh, medical waste, and burning garbage. The ground beneath it sizzled and steamed, and the trees and plants where it landed withered and died. 
and to my horror and disgust, any organic matter of the forest caught in the titan's unholy bile devolved into a puddle of stagnant, steaming waste. And so did Tom. Had I been standing about five foot to the right, none of you would be reading like this. I wasn't standing five foot to the right though. So when the colossal paragon of filth lowered its titanic skull and opened its colish jaw, I walked away unscathed, save for a minor yet still painful bit of acidic backsplash. Tom didn't. He was directly underneath the upended geyser of noxious phlegm that exploded from between the beans, charred and cracked teeth. I'm glad that it all happened too fast for me to process it all. If I had been aware, I might have tried to do something stupid like tackle Tom to get him out of the way. The fact that all I could do was watch with my lip trembling and my bladder emptied is one of the few reasons that I'm still alive. As I watched my friend being consumed by the monster's vomit, I felt a mixture of horror and revulsion that I could never have fathomed was possible. My cowardice and impotency in the face of the sheer evil that we had encountered gave it a cruel, introspective aspect to it. A feeling I imagined isn't far away from finding out that your spouse is a horrible person, or waking up from sleepwalking to find that you have hurt your dog. It's an emotion I'm sure was caused by the towering, pustulant skeleton's presence as much by its actions too. It was a primordial disgust, one stored in the deepest bowels of our DNA to be pulled to the fore, only when the things that terrorized our most ancient ancestors returned. I couldn't bring myself to approach Tom during the few seconds that I lingered at the cliff edge after the waterfall of septic acid had ceased. The black, slimy substance was eating away at his flesh, melting as though he were a discarded wax museum exhibit in the furnace of a crematorium. His skin turned to ashen gray and it began to crumple and fold in on itself like molten tarmac. I could hear his screams of agony, but they were soon drowned out by the sound of his bones snapping and breaking under the weight of his own melting body. It was a sickening sound, like the cracking of wood in a fire and it made my stomach turn, a response worsened by the grisly sights that came with the cacophony of suffering. His final thrashes of pain created enough force to separate what remained of his liquefying muscle and skin from his limbs, leaving him looking like a wailing parody of the glowing eyed of fog nightmare still towering over us. The worst part was that enough of his face remained to make his eyes widening in shock, clear to see in the knowledge that he was aware of everything that happened right up until the end will scar me for life. After what was left of Tom stopped twitching, I felt a wave of nausea wash over me, and I knew that I was going to puke. I turned away from the sight, but the retching continued, and I could feel the bile rising in my throat. It was a violent and uncontrollable reaction, one that was born out of the sheer horror of what I was witnessing. I could feel my muscles contracting and spasming, and then it came. The vomit that I spewed forth wasn't a noxious tide of lethal mucus. It was a thick and chunky mess, a mixture of the dinner that we had eaten earlier and the bile that had been building up in my stomach. It was a disgusting sight, and it only served to make the horror of the situation even more real. Thankfully, I managed to remember why I had just seen Tom literally melt in front of me just in time to throw myself sideways and avoid meeting the same fate myself. The sound of the thing from the fog roaring made my heart skip at least three beats, but the rest of my body didn't care. I ran so hard that blood vessels burst in my thighs, and I've still got the bruises even now. I didn't know where to go beyond that my destination was as far from that Mount Veritat as I could possibly make it. The thing is... I wasn't the only one running. As soon as I could hear the thunderous footsteps behind me, I knew that I was not going to make it out alive. The shaking of the ground near catapulted me over a ledge or down a ravine more than once during the five or so minutes that I actually managed to keep going. It's honestly a miracle that I didn't break my neck. 
Every time I stumbled and fell, I would look over my shoulder to the clouds above the mast, and always I saw the monster's glowing eyes staring down at me. The final time that they were right above me, so close that I could make out their eldritch glimmer casting an obnoxious sheen across the gargantuan skull, I distinctly remember thinking, well this is it, this is the end. The mortician stench reeking in the mist intensified as the mucus began to bubble and pool between jaws, lowering themselves beneath the line of the tree canopy. I closed my eyes, my face suddenly numb, and my limbs inexplicably far away from my senses. And then everything went black. I was passed out for three days. Sheriff Harworst was at the foot of my hospital bed when I awoke and immediately had questions, most of them around where Tom was. I gave him my answers and to my amazement, he didn't call me a lunatic. He just sighed, scribbled something in his notebook and laughed. I was still pretty out of it even by the time that he had gone. It wasn't until a few hours later that the horror of everything that happened hit me like a claw hammer right in my will to live. When I finally regained my senses fully, my mind was a jumbled mess of fragmented memories. Not what happened with me and Tom on Mount Veritat, you understand. That was unfortunately crystal clear. The bits I still can't piece together, despite really needing to, or how I got from there to that hospital. Here's the thing. I agree with you listening to this right now. I should be dead. So what in the deus ex machina is going on? That's what this all is about. Why I'm determined to follow this through and not just swallow up the lie. The first thing that I recall was the sound of gunfire ringing in my ears followed by the deafening roar of the monster. Then, there was a massive explosion that shook the ground beneath me. I remember feeling a rush of hot air and debris hitting my face, before everything went silent. The next thing I remember is the sound of helicopter blades chopping through the air and then the sensation of being lifted off the ground. I must have been airlifted to a hospital, because the next thing I saw was a thin-faced man with a really unnerving aura looking down at me with a disapproving expression. He was muttering something to Sheriff Harworst, but I couldn't make out what they were saying. My head was pounding with pain and I was struggling to stay conscious. Despite the concussion, I knew that something terrible had happened. The monster had been real and it had nearly killed me. But what had happened to it? Had the gunfire and explosion killed it or had it escaped? Who had even shown up to stop it? No way did the police have the minds of munitions you would need to take down something like that. Whatever that thing was. I must have sensed something or heard something that could put the pieces together. It had something to do with the thin-faced man and Sheriff Harworst, but who was he? I couldn't remember and the uncertainty only made me feel more frightened and alone. It was a relief when the doctors finally gave me something to ease my pain and help me slip back into unconsciousness. That was two weeks ago. Tom's disappearance is being treated. I found out through an old friend in the Marathon County Sheriff's Office as a natural accident with the rationale being Tom and I were caught in a freak avalanche. What I saw had been explained away as a concussion-induced dream. Avalanches and concussions don't cause acid burns though, now do they? So why do I have a splatter pattern of them across my right cheek and arm? To this day, I don't know what that monster was or where it came from, or why it didn't let me suffer the same fate as Tom. But I know one thing for sure. Something weird is going on in Marathon County, and the police are at the very least Sheriff Harworst are covering it up. The memory of that night still haunts me, and I can only hope that nobody else will ever have to witness the terror that I did on Mount Veritat. Me though, I need answers even if it means coming face to face with that thing again. I'm writing this as a kind of failsafe I guess. I'm going to go poking around, starting with Harworth's house. My friends reading this, you know who you are, have been told what to do if I disappear after today. 
I'm sorry that I couldn't tell you why you needed my passwords, but would you have believed me before? As for why I'm making it public, it's because I didn't want to put the burden of sharing this on somebody else. This could run deep and there could be consequences for posting or even talking about it. I was the one up there with Tom. All those risks should be on me. Somebody had to blow the whistle though. Something evil is lurking in Marathon County and people need to stay away from Mount Veritat. Consider yourself lucky if you've never been woken up by a tornado alarm. One minute, you're in a deep sleep, dreaming about a better world. And the next, you're being confronted with a waking nightmare. When those alarms go off, you only have a few minutes to wake from your stupor. Gather your family and get to a safe space. A twister could be down the street or across town. You won't know until it either blows your house down or enough time passes that you feel confident that it missed you. In the meantime, you and yours huddle in a closet or a cellar and pray. It's a hazard that I've lived with for most of my life. When you grow up in a part of the country colorfully named Tornado Alley, you learn to live with the storms. I've been lucky that one as it destroyed my house, but I've had a few close shaves. If you've ever seen the power of a massive funnel cloud up close, it never leaves your brain. Watching the natural world destroy nearly indestructible buildings is a fun reminder that Mother Nature is our landlord and people are just the residents on this planet. We can be evicted at any moment. The screeching alarms are as much a part of summer as the crack of a bat and the buzzing of cicadas. They help make up the milieu of Midwest living. The alarm systems are automated and they go off when conditions indicate a potential storm. Even if there isn't a twister, the alarms are a signal that something terrible is approaching. It could be a pounding hailstorm, a weird green sky, or flooding from intense and ceaseless rainfall. Regardless, if the alarms are blaring, some bad stuff is coming your way. This time was worse than all those other times combined. My day had been a pleasant one. The weather was warm, so we spent the day playing in the yard and taking a dip in our pool. It's an above-ground number that we got at a discount, but the water was cool and that's all that mattered. My littlest is still learning and my oldest loves to jump in, so it was a balancing act trying to get both sides to work together. It can be frustrating, but these micro-negotiations were the purview of parenting. It comes with the turf. As afternoon turned into evening, Cindy, my wife, played soccer with the kids while I cooked some burgers on the grill and enjoyed a drink or two. The weather was so perfect that we had outside under our spreading oak tree. My son left his scraps for the ants and I was sure the amount of food that he left would fill the ant's storage quota for the summer. After the sun went down and we put the kids to bed, Cindy and I lay in her hammock, watching the stars and talking about nothing and everything. It's an odd way to think about it, but it was one of those days you'll think about on your deathbed, a moment in time you'll lovingly return to when you're about to cross into the next life. It'll bring a smile to your face at a time when that should seem impossible. When we went to bed a few hours later, the temperature had cooled and there was a slight breeze blowing. Still, there was absolutely no indication of storms on the horizon. When you're in an area where it rains frequently, you can develop a sixth sense of when a storm is coming. You can feel subtle changes in your body. If a distant storm is intense enough, you can smell the petrichor in the air. The smell of dried dirt mingling with rainwater lets you know what kind of torment is coming. But there was none of that. We slept with everything as calm as possible in this rolling modern world. The perfect capstone to the perfect day. One for the ages. And then the tornado siren started blaring. 
when you become a parent, any thought of being a deep sleeper goes out the window. Nature takes away your ability to sleep deeply when you have to take care of little ones. That said, the alarm was loud enough to wake the dead. I sat up in an instant, my eyes open, but the fuzz of the dream world still clouded at the edges of my vision. Tornado, Cindy asked, rubbing the sleep from her eyes. Yeah, I think so. I'll grab the kids. I said, swinging my legs out of bed. Before I could hit the door, I heard the running of two little bodies down the hallway. The sirens had also brought the kids in from the land of Nod. They both were scared and you could see the fear in their tiny faces. They both ran past me and hopped under the blankets with my wife. I grabbed my phone and I looked for an alert from the National Weather Service, but there was nothing. I did a Google search for tornado warnings in my area and I came up with the same. I hauled my body out of bed and I walked to the back slider. I didn't see any rain falling. I opened the door and confirmed that there wasn't even the distant rumble of thunder. But that alarm was steady. It would rise in tone and decibels and then fall again before starting over. If you listened closely, you could hear the different alarms going off further away. It was like they were singing the world's most annoying song in the round. I closed the door and walked back into my bedroom. Cindy was getting the gear ready to go into our shelter when I said to stop. She was confused. Why? There isn't any storm. What? Yeah, I said. There are some scattered clouds, but they're not thunderheads or anything. But the alarms, she said. Maybe it's a malfunction. I hope not, seeing as working tornado alarms are important. I know, I said. But there isn't even a stiff breeze right now. It's just like when we came inside last night. Still and cool, but calm. Uh, should we go to the shelter for a little bit just in case something is forming and we can't see it? I thought about it and it wasn't a bad idea. Yes, the kids would have their night interrupted and would have a hard time falling back to sleep. Yeah, the lack of sleep might also make them little goblins in the morning. Yeah, I was probably being overly cautious. But the downside of being wrong could be death. That was a little worse than kids being grumpy in the morning. I agreed and sent them down into the shelter to wait it out but decided to stay upstairs for now. Our phones worked for crap in the shelter under the house. If I was going to find any new information, I would have to stay above ground for the time being. I helped everybody downstairs and I closed up the shelter. I promised Cindy and the kids that I would join them if things went sideways. I wouldn't dawdle or try to get a good video. I tend to do so. I would be under the house as fast as they could say tornado. If you linger... I'll come grab your butt, storm or no storm. Oh, trust me, I know, I said, giving her a kiss on the forehead. Once my family was safely under the house, I went out to my porch. The alarms were still blaring and it was obvious that my family wasn't the only one awake. Down the darkened street, I could see the porch lights pop on like man-made lightning bugs. What the heck is this? I heard somebody say in the yard next to me, it was my neighbor Rick, and despite being on the tail end of the boomer generation, Rick seemed to swim against the tide. He was more rooted in Gen X than anything. Whenever we would talk outside, he would constantly complain about the old people in our town, as if he was blind to his own receding hairline and wrinkles. Busted alarm, I offered. What? he yelled. I moved closer to him to avoid hollering into the night. Maybe a busted alarm or someone accidentally scheduled a test for 3 in the morning instead of in the afternoon. I don't know, those tests are all controlled by computers. I don't think they would make that kind of mistake. Besides, they would have shut them down by now if it was an accident. I mean, there are some clouds up there. You think a storm is brewing? Not according to the weather birds, Rick said. The Weatherbirds were a local group of weather nerds and storm chasers that he belonged to. There isn't much to do where we live, so we find hobbies wherever possible. 
They said a good cell was hanging out in North Texas, but it wasn't coming this way. I wonder what gives, I said. The government, said a voice to my right. And this was my other neighbor, John. John was very much a boomer and proud of it too. He was a former Marine and hated everything about modern living. As you can imagine, any of my kids' toys that ended up on his lawn, he instantly seized until I went and asked nicely for it. Every time that he would lecture me, I would apologize until he gave my kids frisbee or whatever. He was exhausting. I mean, the weather alert system is run by the government, Rick said. The deep state government, Rick. The bad guys, John said with a sneer. They're up to something. Their master plan includes setting off a false tornado alarm in the middle of the night in the middle of nowhere. I asked. Juan, this isn't the middle of nowhere. Breadbasket of the country and home to several nuclear missile launch sites. John barked. Two, the alarms are a way to set us off balance, to confuse us. If we're focusing on the alarms, we're not watching what they're really doing. Oh, which is... Rick asked in a mix of confusion and amusement. Land clearance. They'll drive us out of here and reclaim our land. Why would they do that? I asked. John just laughed. Boy, you just don't get it, do you? Your whole generation is out to lunch. Well, actually, my whole generation has to work through our lunch breaks. I said, unable to resist the dig. They want to build a re-education center here. Turn real patriots into brain-dead automatons that'll do whatever they tell us to do. Then the government can control us. That'll be when it gets really interesting. Where did you hear that at? Rick asked. I did my own research, John said defensively. Wait, you're against government control now? Rick asked, doubling down. Always have been, he snapped. You guys want to keep your heads in the sand about where we're going as a people, then fine. But society can't take these kind of changes and not pay a consequence for them. If you let the rock creep in, it'll take over. How does any of this connect to the tornado alarm? I said, feeling the exhaustion of the late night talk with John. Clay had warned us about this. He said the stormtroopers would come at night and lock us up. I'm worried this might be the start of something big. I'll grant you this. If they wanted to ensure the citizens they rolled up wouldn't be alarmed, a tornado alarm in the middle of the night would be a way to do it, I said. John laughed. Speak for yourself, he said, raising his shirt to expose a handgun tucked into his pajama pants. What the heck, man, I said. I'll never be caught off guard, he said with a smile. Old Pete and I go everywhere together. Let one of these stormtroopers come around here. I'll blast him where he stands. You both can thank me later. The screaming tornado alarm suddenly went quiet. You could hear the echo in your mind, but the typical night noises return to the world outside our gray matter. The crickets reign supreme again. We all looked at each other in delighted amazement. Guess it wasn't stormtroopers after all, I said. Rick laughed, John didn't. Above us, we heard an eardrum bursting boom. It was like a bomb went off above our heads, only we hadn't seen anything streak by. That was a sonic boom, John said. Seconds later, we heard a different type of boom. Whatever had flown over us had exploded. You could just barely make out the orange flames in the dark clouds. Ah, Jesus, tap dance in Christ. John said, removing his cap and placing it over his heart. What the heck is that? I said, pointing up at the sky. Breaking through the clouds with a white parachute, it was drifting so violently from side to side that I feared it would tip over and send the occupant plunging to the earth. Whoever was strapped to the chute wasn't steering anything. They were dropping right towards our street. There was another sonic boom over our heads, quickly followed by another explosion. Seconds later, another white flower bloomed in the sky. Like their compatriot, they looked zonked out of their southward descent. 
The first, a parachuting pilot showed no signs of slowing and landing harder on the ground than they should have. As soon as their legs hit the pavement of the road, you could hear the sickening snap of both legs. That woke the pilot up. The man screamed so loud that I was afraid he would break glass. Rick had been a paramedic in his younger years and ran over to the pilot to help him in any way that he could. The pilot frantically ripped his helmet and reached for his broken legs, but his harness wouldn't let him grab them. It was for the best. His legs had broken at the shin and they were barely attached. Hey man, I know it hurts, but stop thrashing around. You're going to make it worse, okay? We can save the legs, but you need to listen. Rick said in a more confident and serious tone than I had ever heard him. We're all done, the pilot said, his eyes wide. That thing isn't going to let any of us live. Just put a bullet into me. Shoot me. Shoot me. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw John walk up. I was worried that he would acquiesce to the pilot's request, but instead he smacked the guy across the face. The pilot's frantic motions and screaming had stopped. You're in the uniform, act like it, John said. He nodded at Rick. Let this man do his job, okay? The pilot, still dazed, just nodded. He looked over at John and we locked eyes. I hated the dude, but that was pretty clutch. I gave him a nod and he returned the favor. Rick was able to unhitch the pilot from his ejector seat and lay him on the ground. He went to work, making a splint as best he could. About a dozen people tried to call 911, but their phones didn't work. They couldn't find a signal. Suddenly, the power in the entire neighborhood went out. We were standing in the pitch black darkness when we heard the second pilot land on the street with another snap of their legs. The screams that followed echoed through the quiet neighborhood. Paul... I heard a familiar voice call out. It was Cindy and she was standing with my children on the side of the house. I had dawdled and she was true to her word. Paul, what's going on? I... I never got to finish that thought. From above us came a bassy trumpet blast that did shatter glass. Everybody grabbed their ears and squatted to the ground as if that would make it disappear. I felt my internal organs vibrating. It was unsettling. After the longest 10 seconds of my life, the trumpet blast had stopped. I looked over at my kids and they were sobbing. Cindy did everything she could to hold them together. I ran over, my legs wobbly from the noise and I hugged them tightly. Daddy, what's going on? My son had asked, sobbing. I don't know, I said, deciding that honesty was better than not. Is something coming for us? My daughter said, fear rising in her voice. No, baby, I don't think so. I gave her a tight hug. My eyes looked up until they locked with Cindy's panic-stricken face. I won't let anything happen to you. Who are those guys? My son said, pointing at the two wounded pilots. Pilots? Well, where are their planes? A ball the size of a compact car came hurtling toward the ground. Everybody on the street screamed and ran for cover. The debris slammed into the Anderson home ten houses down, sending a shockwave that swept everybody off their feet. I stood in time to see a second ball hurtling toward our neighborhood. I dove over my family and shielded them as the metal ball slammed into John's house. It instantly exploded, and flames started eating away the home. I laid on them until the dust from the explosion had settled. Once I was sure that there wasn't anything else raining down on us, I got to my feet. My vision was hazy from the dust in the air, but I had a clear view of the ball that had destroyed at John's house. It was one of the jets. Something in the clouds had crumbled up a half billion dollar weapon of war like it was a kid's a paper airplane. That thing is unnatural, the first pilot screamed. This isn't the first attack. The second one yelled. They're come for you all. Run. Run before they come after you. The night sky was again broken by the bone-rattling bass of that horn blowing. 
Again, we all dropped and covered our ears again. The horn stopped, but echoed for ten seconds before it finally dissipated. We all craned our necks and retreated to an explosion of red, blue, green, and yellow lights illuminating the clouds. At first blush, it looked random, but it wasn't. It was a pattern. The pattern repeated two more times, and then everything went dark. It was silent and calm again. All the sounds of the natural world rushed back to your ears. The crickets continued their symphonies, and a gentle breeze blew. It would be idyllic if it weren't for the raging house fires, the panic-stricken pilots, and the balled-up aircraft next to me. Is that it? I said out loud to the universe. I heard a rumbling coming down our street. My emotions couldn't take any more shock, but I was bracing for whatever the heck was coming. I was ready to sprint and hide with my family if I needed to. Soon the humming of dozens of engines filled our ears. The bright yellow headlights of the lead truck illuminated the street. There were dozens of pairs behind them. I was worried that this was an invading force, but relaxed when I saw an American flag on the side of the trucks. The stars and stripes of the military vehicles put my mind at ease. For a second, anyway. And then the inevitable question popped into my mind. Cindy beat me to the punch. What the heck is the army doing here? She asked. I don't know. The line of trucks came to a halt. The engines idled and the noise drowned out the crickets. Even though it was dark, you could still see the exhaust puffing into the air. After a beat, the passenger side of the lead truck popped open, and a high-ranking army official exited the vehicle. He clutched a bullhorn in one hand and a walkie-talkie in the other. Seeing the wounded pilots, he whispered something into his walkie-talkie. Seconds later, we heard the doors of an ambulance open and men marching with medical gear to retrieve the pilots. Rick tried to help, but he was pushed aside. He didn't argue, just took a step back. The medical men stabbed the pilots with some sort of pain medication because they both stopped talking and slumped over in the stretchers. Seconds later, they were placed in the back of the ambulance and gone from our sight. The army official looked at the gathered group of people and raised his bullhorn. In a loud and gruff voice, he spoke. Many of you are probably wondering what happened here. It's my job to inform you that there has been an accident in the skies above your town. Two American pilots experienced a catastrophic failure and their planes were destroyed. The United States Armed Forces will compensate everybody for this unfortunate error. If your house has been destroyed, please contact our intelligence agents who will gather your information. Again, the United States Armed Forces apologizes for this event. Thank you. He lowered his bullhorn. Oh, what were they engaging with? Rick asked. The crowd around him suddenly found their courage and demanded answers. The official raised the bullhorn again. They did not encounter anything. Their jet systems malfunctioned and they crashed. That's a lie, Rick yelled. I understand that this is a lot to take in at once, but we are here to help you, the official said. This was a malfunction on the jets that had caused the crash. I had heard enough. I took a few steps toward the official and pointed at the bald up remains of the jet. Something crushed that freaking plane like it was a potato chip. It's in the shape of a ball, for God's sake. The pilots were screaming about something coming to kill us. What is that about? Rick said, his anger rising with the crowds. This group of neighbors and block party participants were rounding into an angry mob right before our eyes. They were in shock from the trauma, the official said. Oftentimes, pain will make you say things. No, it doesn't, Rick said. I worked in trauma hospitals my whole life. Nobody ever starts ranting about government conspiracies when they get hurt. What aren't you telling us? We are telling you the truth. Well, I think he's lying, I screamed. The crowd cheered in agreement. 
There is a palpable anger growing in the crowd. And the official must have sensed it too, because he glanced back at the convoy of trucks and gave a curt nod. Suddenly every door opened and full armed soldiers got out and fell into formation behind him. You can't intimidate us. You can't force a lie into us. We know what we saw. He raised his bullhorn again. You are mistaken, sir. Hallucination is a side effect of exposure to the chemicals from the exploded jet. I recommend you all go into your homes and wait until our cleanup crews can ensure that the spill is contained. At once, every soldier flipped off their safeties. The message was clear. Go and forget this happened or else. And despite the implied threat, something in me snapped. Instead of being cowed, I took another step toward the soldiers. I picked up a rock and I hurled it at the jet. It rang off the metal. That's not a hallucination. That's real. I said pointing up at the sky. Whatever the heck up there did it, this was real too. We heard the noise, we saw the lights. It set off the tornado alarms. Sir, I advise you and your family to return to your home. A gunshot rang out. For a second, everybody froze in place. I was worried that the soldiers would open fire on us. I felt my resolve drain from me in that moment of impending death. I looked over and realized that John had let old Pete join the conversation. The old marine stood with a pissed off scowl in his face and his smoking gun aimed at the sky. What about my home? I looked over and was surprised to see John walking toward the soldiers as angry as I had ever seen him. It's gone. As I said, the official started. John fired another shot in the air to silence him. The soldiers trained their guns on John but had a subtle hand gesture from the official that kept the bullets from flying. I gave everything for this country, for the constitution, for freedom. I gave my youth a fighting for this country, side to side with brothers in arms. I watched friends die. I knew the government was full of it but I always believed the military was a safeguard. But now, this is the crap you're going to pull on us. This is how you treat a fellow service member. Thank you for your service, the official said. I'll blow it, John retorted. The crowd went nuts. We all started yelling and massing. Cindy grabbed at me, but I turned and told her to take the kids inside. She opened her mouth to protest, but stopped when we had locked eyes. It was righteous indignation. I had to see this through. She grabbed my kids and rushed them back into the safety of the house. The official gave another signal, and three soldiers aimed their weapons into the air and fired off a few dozen rounds. The crowd went silent so quickly that you could hear the shell casing at the concrete. It sounded like a baby playing a xylophone. The crowd stopped advancing. The official ignored the rest of us and focused all his attention on John. I understand your frustration, but if you were a good soldier, you would remember the chain of command. The official said, nodding to his rank, a designation on his shoulder. Good soldiers follow rank. You are a good soldier, right? That caught John. He paused and you could see him mulling the words over in his mind. This man had acquiesced to power his whole life. Heck. He had been a tool of it for most of his adult years. Now for the first time he was challenging it. John saw himself as an honorable man, a loyal man, not a rabble rouser or something like that. We all waited for him to respond with bated breath. And then the rain started falling. Or I thought it was rain, but when it hit my arm it burned. Each drop sizzled as it hit our skin. A person in the crowd looked and a drop hit them square in the eye. They screamed in pain and fell to the ground, clutching their face. It was like some kind of acid was falling on us. Oh crap, the official said, all of his bluster fleeing at once. They seeded the clouds. They're coming. Everybody, back inside the vehicles. All of the soldiers hustled back inside their trucks. The official gave the crowd a look and yelled, 
Get inside, now. Before he took off for the safety of his truck, I turned and ran for my house, and as I did, a trumpet blast sent a shockwave that created a small earthquake. I tripped and fell, the falling rain stinging my exposed neck. My ears rang from the blast, but I wove myself into the house. As soon as I had entered the door, I stripped off my clothes and tossed them outside. The rain had started to eat through the fabric. I wrapped myself in a throw blanket and rushed to the window to watch the scene unfolding in front of us. I was surprised to see John still standing out there. He hadn't moved from that spot. It was like the decision to go against his core beliefs had caused a malfunction in his brain. As he had aged, his beliefs had curdled into conspiracy. The force he thought was a bulwark against his dreaded, deep state now seemed to be working in concert with it. It was too much for him to bear. He stood there and let the rain eat him away piece by piece. He didn't even scream as his skin sloughed off his body. Instead, he raised old Pete to his temple and he pulled the trigger. I slammed the blind shut and turned away. Reality had broken through. We were in real danger. I grabbed my family and went to the back of the house. We would ride out whatever was happening and pray that it didn't get worse. My kids asked me to explain what was going on, but I didn't find an answer that wouldn't make things worse. I instead hugged them tight and told them that I loved them. All I could hear outside was the rain, or whatever it actually was falling on the roof. I prayed that it wouldn't eat through the shingles. I knew there was probably a beehive's worth of activity going on outside with the military there, but still my rational brain had returned to me. I no longer cared about anything but surviving the night. We stayed that way for two hours. At some point, the adrenaline wore off and the three of them fell asleep. I couldn't though because my mind was still reeling. But more than that, I felt the energy around me shift. I felt my mind start to slip. I've written all this down because I think something is messing with my mind. And I wanted to share my story in case I go crazy or something. I wanted to make sure that I got the details just right in case my brain is liquefying or something. I don't know what's waiting for us tomorrow morning, but I'm not sure I'll even make it until then. As soon as I got inside, I started feeling a tickling sensation down my arms and legs. It's like somebody was dragging their fingernails down my skin. I think this has to do with that rain because no one else in my house had mentioned feeling that. The rain never fell on them. In the last 10 minutes or so, I've started noticing moving black shadows in the corners of my vision. When I look at the figures, they disappear, but they return. They always return. I can sense them watching me. I don't know what they are or what they want, but I'm sure they're not here for a cup of coffee. I can feel my eyes growing heavy, but I'm afraid to sleep. I'm worried they'll come for me then. I'm so scared that I'll end up like John. I'm feeling my strength drain from me. I'm drifting now, powering down. I see them emerging from the shadows. Oh God. It's taken me a long time to be able to talk about this publicly. For a while, I didn't speak at all, not a word to anybody. I told the police what had happened a hundred times and eventually, I was so numb that I felt like I had lost the ability. I didn't have enough energy in my body to push words out. It's an indescribable type of emptiness. At the request of law enforcement as well as a last ditch effort to convince anybody that what I saw really happened. I'm going to do my best to recount the events that happened that day. Unfortunately, I watched almost the entire thing unfold. So, me and my fiance Anne were going through a bit of a rough patch. Some days we were great, but on others, we were like strangers. On the last day that we spent together, I cooked her dinner and she refused to eat a bite. I spent half the day cooking. I looked up a fancy recipe to impress her, and she wanted none of it. I couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. To 
Despite a promise that I had made to her, I went out to my car and started taking sips off of a bottle of rum that I had hidden there. My drinking was often an issue between us. I always dealt with lots of anxiety and depression. It made me feel numb. It allowed me to turn my mind off for a little while at a time. At least I told myself that. She didn't understand why I needed that. I made her feel like she was not enough. The reason was the opposite though. I wasn't enough for her. She had a good job, she was beautiful, she was intelligent. I'm none of these things and I was unemployed at the time. I was unemployed more often than not during our time together. I felt inadequate. She said that I didn't listen enough and that I had a complete inability to listen when I was drinking. On the last day that we spent together, I tried to cook her a gourmet meal because she had mentioned it a few days prior. She said that she was sick of eating the same things day in and week out. She painted us as an old couple sitting in Lazy Boys with our TV dinners, repeating these same day over and over. I found this to be a vast exaggeration, but maybe she was somewhat right. In any case, we decided to take some time apart. I had moved in with my buddy Eric, the last real friend that I had. I lost touch with the rest after I had started seeing Anne, but Eric was a ride or die though and was happy to help at least for a few weeks. He had an extra room and it was a nice setup. It was just far away from her though, too far for my comfort. I regularly tried to call her but she wouldn't answer, that was painful. Being locked out by the person you love is just tough. I was desperate for a way to contact her or see her, but I knew that she didn't want to see me. And then one day, I remembered the cameras. I felt creepy, believe me. I didn't want to stalk her or watch her without her knowledge. I just wanted to see her from time to time. I just checked once in a while just so that I could see her face. It was only a week or so between me leaving and what happened. I had only checked the cameras a few times. I couldn't get it off my mind though, so I turned notifications on for the app. I didn't want to spy on her, but I didn't know if she was seeing someone. If somebody came to the door, I would get a notification. And eventually I got one. I opened the app to see that there was a man at the door. Immediately my heart sank. She was seeing someone. That was a bit of a knee-jerk reaction though. I watched the footage as she opened the door. It turned out to be a door-to-door -door salesman. An odd a little man with a goofy mustache. He was dressed very oddly too. Suspenders over a purple dress shirt and a top hat wielding a unicycle. She opened the door and pretty quickly told him that she wasn't interested in buying anything. You don't know what I'm selling yet though, ma'am. The salesman said. So, what are you selling? Anne asked. Unicycles. He gleefully replied. Anne laughed. The salesman shrugged as if he was used to this response. I'm sorry, but I don't need a new unicycle at the moment. She laughed. I think you do. The salesman said as his demeanor changed from upbeat to almost sinister. Can I trouble you for a glass of water? Anne seemed flustered by the request. I immediately became concerned and I tried to call her. I'd be lying if I said that it didn't hurt to watch her on the camera, look at her phone, and then silence the ringer. After she ignored my call, she invited the salesman in. I was stunned. No one sells unicycles door to door. Why is she letting this man into the house? I tried calling again and then I texted. And then I called again and she continued to ignore me. I decided to head over there. Something was off. Something was up with this guy. From the place where I was staying, it would normally take about 40 minutes to drive to Anne's place. Not that day though. I hit a traffic jam pretty early. Apparently, there had been an accident somewhere up the highway and we were at a standstill. I called and called again, but she would not answer me. I used my tablet to periodically check the camera. I had a good data plan for the tablet so I could keep the camera on as long as it would hold a charge. 
My phone was dying though. As traffic came to a complete halt, I started watching the camera closely again. She had invited him into the kitchen. They were sitting and talking as he drank his water. She then excused herself to use the bathroom. From where the cameras were positioned, I could see the doorway and a bit of the living room on one, the front porch and the woods across the street on another, and most of the kitchen from the last one. I kept watching the salesman in the kitchen while she was in the bathroom. She sat still for a few moments, but then he got up and started slowly walking around the kitchen. He made his way to the sink and refilled his water glass, and then he stopped at the knife block. My heart rate exploded when he took one of the knives out of the block. He slid his finger along the blade and then he put it back and did the same with another one of the knives. After the third one, he turned around quickly as if he had heard something. He put the knife back and quickly sat back down where he was when she had left the room. This is when I entered full-on panic mode. I had cars on every side of me and I couldn't escape the traffic jam. and wouldn't answer the phone. I felt helpless. I tried to call her yet again and this time I went straight to voicemail. She had either blocked me or turned off her phone. I tried two more times with no luck. I sat there freaking out when she didn't answer and realized that it was time to call the police. It was like it was fate. I ended my latest attempted call to Anne and I started dialing 911. That's when my phone died. I knew that I would have to go car to car begging an upset stranger in a traffic jam to let me use their phone to call the police. And before I embarked on this journey, I looked at the camera again from the tablet. What I saw made me feel sick. They were kissing. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. This clown shows up at the doorstep with his suspenders and his top hat and his freaking unicycle, and she brings him inside of her home to hook up with them. I didn't know who the heck this person was. I'm not talking about the unicycle salesman, I'm talking about Anne. Shy, sweet, intelligent Anne. This just wasn't her. Any random hookup doesn't seem like something that she would do, especially not with this guy. This stranger who showed up at our house selling something he knows, nobody is going to buy. Anne is the furthest thing from a ditz. Cheesy lines didn't work on her. Pickup lines didn't work on her. She preferred intelligent and engaging conversations. She simply wasn't dumb enough to believe that this guy was really selling unicycles. When they finally stopped making out, they went back to the kitchen. He again went to the knife block and pulled a knife out. My heart raced and I prepared to get out of the car to start begging somebody for their phone to call the police. And then he spoke. Are you going to let me cook for you tonight? He asked. She smiled and said, I thought we could have something delivered. I was totally confused. Oh, had she been seeing this guy? Had this been going on since before I had left? I never even considered checking the cameras before. I can't now. They don't record unless you set them to. We live in a nice neighborhood. I never had a reason to suspect her of infidelity. I just didn't get it. I felt numb watching them, but I couldn't look away. A hurricane of pain and confusion swirled in my head. Why the suspenders? Why these salesmen ruse? Was she into some sort of bizarre role play? Is that why I wasn't satisfying her? I felt sick but a bit relieved at the same time. I was angry. That didn't mean that I wanted to watch her get attacked by a madman though. Apparently, she knew this goofy unicycle salesman and apparently he made her happy. I kept the tablet on but tried not to look as often. I was torn. I didn't want to see it but I couldn't look away. I figured since I wouldn't be driving for a while, I could take a few sips off of the rum that I had stashed in the car from before. I sat there trying to drown my sorrows. I watched them discuss what to order for dinner. I watched as she turned her phone back on and laughed at how many times I had called and texted. I was pathetic to her and maybe she was right. Although I also thought that she was too good for me and maybe I was wrong. I decided to shut the tablet off and stop torturing myself. The traffic was still completely stalled. 
Every song that came on the radio made me think of Anne, even though she barely liked music in general. I used to think it was the strangest thing about her. Everything would always remind me of her, though. About a half hour went by before I got a notification on the tablet. Their food had arrived. They had ordered pizza. Of course, Anne would never eat pizza with me. It was always a salad or something healthy. Actually, looking back, she barely ate at all. I watched as she opened the door and searched her pockets, and then invited the pizza guy into the doorway while she got her wallet. She walked out of frame and he seemed to be talking to her, and that's when things took a horrifying turn. The unicycle salesman came into frame and slowly approached the pizza guy from behind. He was holding the unicycle. He lifted the unicycle holding the bar just below the seat, and then he struck the pizza guy in the back of the head with the other end. I panicked as I watched. The pizza guy fell to the floor and the unicycle salesman pounced on his back. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a syringe, quickly jabbing it into the guy's neck. Moments later, Anne walked back into frame. The salesman looked up at her with a smile in his face and said, Not too messy, right? He then pulled a pistol out from his pocket and said, I told you that I wouldn't need a gun. Knowing Anne, I expected her to scream in fear and start running out of the house, realizing that she had invited a psychopath inside. Instead, she laughed and said, I'm better to have it and not need it. I had no idea what to do. I worried that she was in danger. I would have never expected in a million years that she would hurt somebody. It was like this creepy unicycle salesman had her hypnotized. It simply wasn't her. Looking at the tablet, I couldn't believe my eyes. The pizza boy was lying unconscious on the floor as Anne and the salesman stepped out of frame. They both re-entered at the same time from different directions. The salesman walked out to the front porch where he grabbed a duffel bag that was sitting there on the porch. I hadn't noticed the bag before. Anne returned from somewhere further in the house, carrying what looked like a tarp. The salesman set the bag down and took the tarp from Anne. He spread it out on the ground next to the pizza guy, and then together they both rolled him onto the center of the tarp. The salesman grabbed the duffel bag and knelt down next to the unconscious pizza guy. Anne gave him a kiss and smiled before saying, I'll get the kitchen ready. I was baffled, absolutely baffled. Baffled doesn't do the feeling justice. There are no words to describe how I felt when I watched what they were doing and what they were about to do. Not only to see something so horrifying in general, but to know that I was living with this person. This person that I loved and thought I knew was capable of. Sorry, I had to take a quick break there. Uh, I'm going to do my best to explain what I saw next. She, uh, she started pulling pots and pans out of the cupboard. She grabbed some spices off the rack and some butter from the fridge. She set a pan on the stove and started to burn it before throwing in some butter. I was so focused on her, I was so confused. It was a lot to see all at once. I was so focused on her that I didn't see what the salesman was doing in the other room. When I switched back to the other camera, all I could see was the salesman hovering over the pizza guy. He was now wearing what looked to be a garbage bag over his clothes. It wasn't until he moved a little that I realized what he was doing. And the moment that I saw it and realized what he was doing, I opened the car door and vomited. After that, I grabbed some napkins from the glove box and wiped my face as I tried to catch my breath and combat the quickly oncoming panic attack. I had no idea that it was about to get even worse. I need another break. What I had seen on the camera was the unicycle salesman cutting the pizza guy. Not just cutting, but chopping, flaying, dismembering. He was chopping him up. The duffel bag was full of knives, saws, even a pizza cutter. I've never seen something so disgusting in my entire life. Nothing close to this. I didn't want to look at the camera again, but I had to know. It was like a train wreck. I didn't know what to do. 
I was stuck in my car. My phone was dead. For a moment, I tried to convince myself it wasn't even really happening. Maybe I had completely lost my mind. That would have been preferable. When I finally looked back at the camera, I watched as these salesmen pulled off chunks of flesh and placed them into containers. He sawed and hacked as Anne acted perfectly normal in the kitchen, like she was about to prepare dinner. After a few minutes, I could see the salesman get up, pick up one of the full, blood-soaked containers and walk it into the kitchen. Somehow, I still had hope that Anne was the person that I knew at that point. I prayed that she would scream when the man walked in with this container of human meat, but she smiled instead. She smiled in a way that I had never seen her smile before. It looked so sinister. The same look the unicycle salesman had on his face when he had first showed up. He set the container on the counter. She, um, she started grabbing bits and throwing them into the pan. They both smiled and he gave her a little kiss before returning to the other room to finish what he was doing. He started walking out of the kitchen before turning around. He asked Anne, Do you have records? I saw the turntable in the living room. Some music would be nice. Anne told him that she did have records in the cabinet under the turntable. She lied. She doesn't have records. I do. That turntable is probably the only thing of mine she allowed in that house. The only thing she allowed me to have of my own. As I said before, Anne didn't really like any music. Once in a while, she would get into one of the new Top 40 pop hit songs, but that was about it. She told the salesman the records were hers, though. He walked to the turntable. What should we listen to? He asked. Up to you, she replied. No, oh, how about the Misfits? He asked excitedly. Oh, is that punk or heavy stuff? Anne replied. I would like to listen to something a little more upbeat. Fair enough, the salesman replied. He then knelt down next to the body of the pizza guy and said, Yeah, sorry buddy, that was my first choice too. Hey, if I cut off your arms and cut off your legs, would you still love me anyway? He then laughed and continued looking through the records. Before long, he made another selection. He didn't ask Anne's opinion this time. He selected a record and put it on the table. Before he turned it on, he walked back into the kitchen. I found something perfect, he said. I gotta stop wasting time though. Our friend only has one more delivery. I texted the number saying that their pizza would be late, so that they would get it for free. So hopefully it bought us some time. I gotta get moving on this though. Try a bite first, Anne said with a smile as she continued flipping the bits of meat in the pan. Okay, but quickly, the salesman replied. Hold on one second. He scurried into the living room and turned on the turntable. He put the stylus down and headed back into the kitchen. The music started playing. It was. I'm into something good. It was the original version by the Cookies. More specifically, Earl Jean McCree. A good song that is forever ruined for me now. I guess that isn't important. It just made the scene so much more eerie and bizarre. The song started as Anne got a piece of meat out of the pan with a fork. She fed the bite to the salesman. My stomach turned again. She then took a bite herself. It was beyond horrific. They ate bits of this presumably innocent pizza guy as upbeat music played in the background. The salesman kissed Anne on the cheek and then returned to the pizza guy on the floor. He continued cutting pizzas off as Anne continued cooking. All the while, something tells me I'm into something good continued playing. It was like watching a twisted montage. I couldn't look away. The police asked me why I didn't get out of my car right then and there to beg somebody for their phone to call the police. Why did I watch it for so long? I had difficulty answering that. I pretty much did, it just took me a minute. I was practically in a trance. 
It's difficult to process things in real time, especially something like this. This brutal, horrific sight playing out to a happy-go-lucky sounding song that I used to really enjoy. It's just, it was a lot. Too much for my psyche to handle. Eventually, I turned off the tablet screen before opening the door to dry heave. This is when I got out of the car again. I needed to contact the police. I tried to get one of the other cars around me to roll down the window for me to explain and ask to use the phone, but nobody would. They assumed I was some madman who jumped out of his car in the middle of a traffic jam. These people were already irritated and I was trying to knock on the windows. To them, I was just a nut job holding a tablet with a violent video playing on it. Despite several people laying on their horns and yelling out their windows at me to get back into my car, I decided to run up the road. I knew that I was roughly a mile from the accident and that there would have to be law enforcement there. As I ran, people beeped their horns at me, yelled things at me, threw things at me, but I didn't care. I needed to find help. I periodically looked back at the tablet. It didn't get any less disgusting. By now, the salesman had removed limbs from the pizza guy. He started loading the containers into a cooler. Our cooler. The same cooler that Ann and I took camping last summer. She complained the entire time on that trip. I thought that she would enjoy being in nature, but she must have been fantasizing about something else. I didn't want to switch back to the camera that could see the kitchen, but I couldn't help myself. Just then, though, traffic had started moving. I looked up ahead and still wasn't close enough to the accident site or any police cars. Traffic quickly got back to normal speeds and I realized that they had cleared the road. I decided to run back to my car. I was blocking traffic. I didn't know how far I was from the accident scene or if there would still be police there when I got there. I sprinted back to my car as fast as I could. When I finally made it back to it, there were several cars stuck behind it trying to merge into the other lane. People were still beeping and yelling. I jumped in as fast as I could and pulled out. I continued to drive in toward Ann's house, though I wasn't sure what to do at this point. When I made the mistake of looking back at the tablet, I tried my best to not puke again, unsuccessfully. This is verifiable. Police know that I absolutely did puke into the passenger seat of my car while driving. Not a pleasant experience, but none of this was. When I looked back, they were both in the kitchen. She was frying up pieces, pulling off little pieces of meat out of the pan and started feeding it to each other. It was sick and disgusting and bizarre. He caressed her leg as he fed her a piece. She kissed his neck and rubbed his thigh as she fed him a piece. I again vomited into the passenger seat while trying not to wreck my car. I continued heading towards Ann's house. I didn't know where else to go in the area. I guessed that I should have gone to the police station. I think I was in shock though. I wasn't thinking clearly. I mean, how could I? I was still about a half hour away. I continuously made the mistake of looking at the tablet to see the horrific feast. I tried to keep the screen off because the tablet was now running out of battery. I decided to drive straight there rather than stopping at the one single tiny gas station between Ann and where I was. It was getting late and it seemed like the place was always closed either way. I was about 10 minutes away when I couldn't help myself but check again. They looked like they were finishing up for the moment. They were no longer eating. They were having a discussion. Anne said, I can't wait for dessert. The unicycle salesman replied, Just let me deliver the next pizza on our new friend's route. I'll call you when I'm ready to ditch the car. Meet me at the place that we discussed. And then we can come back here for a real meal. Anne smiled and agreed. The salesman then rolled the remains of the pizza guy in the tarp. He bound it together with bungee cords, and then he dragged the pizza guy out of the house and put him in the trunk of his own car. After that, he drove away. I was about to switch back to the kitchen camera when the tablet had died. I felt angry, but a little relieved that I didn't have to watch anymore. 
Still, I felt the need to confront her. My mind was blown and my world was upside down. She owed me a heck of an explanation, so I went to her house. I arrived about 10 minutes after the tablet had died. I wasn't sure if she would still be there. Her car was there, though. I got out and approached the front door. I was still in a state of panic. I tried to take deep breaths as I rang the doorbell. I waited, but there was no response. I tried the door and was surprised that it was unlocked. I slowly walked into the house. The smell was the first thing that I noticed. It kind of smelled like pork, almost metallic too. I don't know, I thought it kind of smelled like metal. Maybe I was just about to have a stroke from the stress, the horror, the confusion. I guess that's burnt toast though, right? It doesn't matter, I'm rambling. I would prefer to talk about absolutely anything other than this. The music was still playing as I slowly walked in. The same song, actually. It was an EP. There's only two songs on it. The cheery song made me feel even more uneasy as I approached the kitchen. I woke up this morning feeling fine, because there was something special on my mind. Last night, I met a new boy in the neighborhood. Maybe the lyrics convey how Anne felt. We only talked for a minute or two, and it felt like I knew him the whole night through. I don't know if people fall in love, but he's everything I've been dreaming of. Sorry, I don't know why I keep singing that song. I hate that song now. I think I'm just trying to distract myself. I really don't want to continue. But I will. I wouldn't want to obstruct an investigation. And so I walked into the kitchen and there she was. She was sitting at the table peacefully looking down at an empty plate. She didn't have much of a reaction to seeing me. She didn't seem mad that I would shown up unannounced or that I had walked in when nobody had answered the door. Actually, she looked more at peace in that moment than she ever did when we were together. Hi, Anne, I said nervously. What a surprise, she said calmly. You really can't just show up like this. I, uh, sorry. I struggled to find the words when I was finally face to face with her. What brings you by? She asked, still as calm and emotionless as before. There was an accident and um, I was worried. I, what are you eating? Her cocky smirk left her face for a moment. It was chilling, the way that she looked at me. I'm not eating anything right now. Oh, what were you eating? Beef, she laughed. What is it to you? There was a long pause. She sat there awaiting my response. I had difficulty figuring out how to say it. It's like the words were stuck. And what is going on with you? You're the one showing up here and letting yourself in, she said. I finally just blurted it out. What the heck did I just witness? What just happened here? I need you to explain to me what I just watched on the cameras. The cameras? She started to ask, but quickly realized what I was talking about. She had forgotten about them too. You've been spying on me, she asked. No, don't worry. I haven't been watching you day in and day out. I haven't been stalking or spying, I swear. All I saw was what happened here tonight, and I really need an explanation for that. You're so dramatic, she said laughing. You're kidding, right? I said. I was getting angrier. That cocky look on her face just, I asked her again. What was that? Well, I've told you before that I wanted to try new things. She said in the most irritating way possible. New things? I thought you meant a trip. Maybe a fancy dinner not attacking an innocent person with a Willy Wonka impersonator, and especially not. I couldn't say it, but I gestured to the stove. New things, she said quietly. It's kind of hard to explain. I guess it's the taboo aspect. It's not sexual, not all sexual. It's about pushing boundaries. I've been realizing that the society that we live in just isn't for me. I want to try things that people aren't supposed to. 
We find it strange because we're taught to find it strange. It's rules ingrained in us. Those rules aren't natural. I interrupted and said, You sound like a drug addict right now who's staying in something you think is profound when it's really just nonsense to justify doing something really bad. She ignored what I said and continued her rant. I think it's a primal thing. We want what we can't have. A child doesn't want a toy until they see another kid playing with it. The girl doesn't want the guy until she thinks that she can't have him. She continued, but this was when I recognized Anne's trademark, ramble away from the point thing. Her eyes began to wander as well, and that's when I saw him. There was a chrome-colored toaster on the counter. It's ironic to think about it now, but I had wanted the black one. Anne always gets her way though, so we ended up with the reflective chrome. As her eyes moved to where he was standing, I noticed the reflection of the unicycle salesman in the toaster. He was a few steps behind me, slowly approaching. I pretended to not notice for a moment, and then I saw him lift the unicycle over his head like he did with the pizza guy. As soon as he began to swing, I ducked and dropped to the floor. He barely missed my head. I kicked the nearest chair into him, got up and ran. He was blocking the hallway to the front door, so I ran toward the back. I could hear him kick the chair away and start running after me. I frantically tried to quickly open the back door, but it was locked and latched. In a panic, I ran upstairs. I need to take a break here to explain. The police don't understand why I didn't just unlock the back door. There's two locks and a chain lock on that door. I knew from before that the salesman had a gun. I was in a frenzied panic and he was right behind me. I heard him say, I bet you taste like candy. And I just panicked and ran upstairs. I ran into our, sorry, Anne's bedroom. I didn't recognize it and hadn't even been that long. But she had erased any trace of me ever having lived there. Sorry, that's not important. I ran into the room and slammed the door shut. There was a lock, but it barely worked. All you had to do was jiggle the handle and Anne knew it. I knew she had a gun in her bedroom, though. We had actually argued about it before. I don't like guns, I never have. I told her that having one in the house would make it more likely that one of us would end up getting shot. As I've said before, though, Anne gets what Anne wants. I came home one day and there it was. The best that I could get her to do was compromise and get a save for it. She begrudgingly agreed to it. It was now working against me though. I knew the combination, but I was so panicked and afraid for my life that I couldn't stop my hands from shaking. I could hear the salesman stomping down the hall before he started banging on the bedroom door. I took deep breaths as I got the first two numbers, then accidentally passed the third. My heart sank as I started over. As I frantically tried a second time to the sound of banging on the door, I yelled, Leave me alone. The banging stopped as I got the safe open and grabbed the gun. I went to flip the safety off, but it was already off, of course. I faintly heard Anne's voice say, Just jiggle it, referring to the door lock. It hurt to hear her say that, even after everything that I had witnessed. Even after realizing that she had been living a lie, there was a madman trying to kill me and she was helping him do that. Moments later, the doorknob started jiggling. I knew that he was about to get in, I knew that he had a gun, and I knew that he was a psychopath. I heard the lock click after a few seconds. I sat against the nightstand next to the bed. I held the gun tightly with both hands and pointed it at the door. The door started to open. I winced and I pulled the trigger. My eyes were barely open as I heard the body hit the floor by the doorway. I felt frozen at first. I didn't want to move. I didn't want to look. I didn't realize at first that it wasn't the unicycle salesman. It was Anne. I screamed when I realized it was her. I knew that it was the salesman who had been banging on the door. I heard his voice. She must have moved him out of the way to open it herself. It was another habit of hers. She could never just tell you how to do something if you asked. She would take over and endure it herself. I should have realized that. 
I ran over to her as soon as I realized that it was her. When I got to her, I could see the salesman running down the stairs. He was a coward. He hit the pizza guy from behind. He tried to hit me from behind, and he ran off when Anne was hurt. I wished that she was only hurt. I tried to put pressure on the wound and immediately grabbed her phone and called the police. She was unresponsive and unconscious from the moment that I got to her. I tried CPR and applying pressure right up until the paramedics and police had arrived. They, uh, they, you know, pronounced her uh, moments after they got there. Please, one more quick break. I immediately told the police about the unicycle salesman. They weren't buying it. They didn't want to hear it. Maybe they could have caught up with him if they had taken me seriously. He didn't exactly blend in. They could have found him. They felt that. They already had their guy, though. Me. That's, um, that's how it happened. I didn't know anything about this unicycle salesman or any other guy that she had been talking to prior to this. She never once mentioned having the desire to break taboos. It was an absolute shock to me. And on top of losing her and trying to process everything that happened, now I have to prove my own innocence. No, I don't like to generalize, but in my experience, once the police have a theory, they aren't happy about it being challenged. They like for things to be easy for them. It's a lot easier to pin this on the jealous ex than find the real culprit. Sorry, I was... I am frustrated about that. They could have gotten him. Who knows where he is now and what he's doing. He could be chatting online with the next person that he's planning on brainwashing. He did brainwash Anne. She may have had issues, but he caused what happened and he got away. They believe that the unicycle salesman was a creation by me, intended to be so bizarre that they would never believe that I would make it up. I wish that were true, that I wouldn't have to constantly wonder where he is and what he's doing. One officer interrupted me as I was telling them about the salesman and said, Let me guess, you can't make this stuff up. I never said that, and I hate when people say that. You can make up anything. A writer like H.P. Lovecraft made up entire worlds and galaxies and universes. Someone who sincerely says you can't make this up is either lying about what they just told you or they're very unimaginative. The cops are suspicious of how I acted that day. No one can say what they would do in a hypothetical situation. This is something the police are struggling to grasp. Opening the lock to a back door or to a gun safe seems simple until you're under intense and life-threatening circumstances. They asked why I never hit record on the cameras, and I get that. I was just stunned. My mind was going a million miles an hour. I was having a panic attack. I was puking. I was too panicked to stop and think clearly. They asked why I didn't use somebody else's phone to call the police. Ask out the other people in the traffic jam that question, I tried. Maybe it's because of people like the unicycle salesmen. People don't trust people anymore and I'm not sure that they should. They said that no one else saw the unicycle salesman. It was clear that he knew Anne beforehand. He wasn't actually going door to door. I don't know how we got there. My biggest regret is never hitting record on the camera. There wasn't room in my mind for that thought at the time. I didn't see him walk up. I don't know if he got dropped off or had a car around the bend. Maybe he rode his stupid unicycle all the way there. I don't know. I don't know why he was dressed that way. I don't know if it was a part of the whole ritual or something that he normally wears. The police interviewed the people who had the pizza delivered after Ann's house. They described the delivery person as having curly hair and a mustache. They said that he didn't talk much and kept the brim of his hat pulled low. It sounded more like the unicycle salesman, but the police dismissed it because I could have worn a fake mustache and a wig. The answers they got didn't support their theory, so they weren't interested. Again, it sounded like they wanted it to be me because it's easier for them. They already have me. I haven't been taken into custody, but if I leave the county, they'll arrest me in a heartbeat. As for my phone dying at the very moment I tried to call 911, what can I say, it's just the type of thing that happens to me. Of course, moments. 
In those moments where things go perfectly wrong at specifically the right time, my life is full of them. Look, I can only tell you what happened. This is what happened. They asked about my alibi over and over. They interrogated me for hours. They even played I'm into something good on repeat for a while to gauge my reaction. After what I had seen and been through though, I consider that torture. I could go on and on about the police and how they misbehaved throughout all of this, but there's no use for that. Soon they'll get the autopsy back. They will see the contents of Anne's stomach. Maybe some evidence from the pizza guy's car or something else like that could prove my innocence. But for now I live in a state of paranoia. I sit and wonder if or when the police will come and arrest me for a horrific crime that I didn't commit. Mostly though I think about him. I thought that I saw him a few times for brief moments. Probably my mind playing tricks on me or maybe PTSD. I'm just so paranoid that the unicycle salesman will come back. I do apologize if I rambled a bit at the end there. I'm not sure how much longer I'll be able to tell the story the way that it actually happened. I need someone to know even if they can't help me. I'll address any questions that people may have in the comments as long as I have the freedom to do so. I will also try to update if there are any new developments. If I don't update, I guess you can assume that the police decided to charge me, or that the unicycle salesman came back. One last thing, they found a full, uneaten pizza at Ann's. If I had been there earlier, that wouldn't have been the case. I really am just trying to get the truth out there. I want people to believe that I'm innocent, but mostly, I want them to know that he's out there. He's real and he could be brainwashing your significant other right now. Or maybe he'll just show up at the front door. If he does, for the love of God, don't let him in. I'm man enough to admit it. I never wanted kids. It took me a long time to realize that about myself. Too long and now I'm in a bit of a bind because a few weeks ago, my wife gave birth. I thought that I had always wanted children. Jess and I used to talk about having kids constantly, even before we got married. It took us 15 years to conceive. 15 long years of endless doctor's meetings, negative pregnancy tests, and just about everything else that you can think of. Including one very traumatic thing that happened after the nursery was painted and even names were picked out. Long enough after that that the little buggers still needed the delivery room to be retrieved. Yeah, it was a rough decade and a half. The kind of rough that means giving up and admitting it was all for nothing becomes a potentially PTSD-inducing turn of events in and of itself. Fifteen years is a long, long time and we weren't getting those years back. By that point, if I had won the argument, if we had turned away from Vermes Regina, neither of us would have got what we want. After 15 years, this war was either ending with a baby in our home or it was ending Jess. There really couldn't be a middle ground after what we had put ourselves through. I kept telling myself that it was worth it though, because we wanted kids. That's all we had ever wanted, or so I thought. It turns out I was only half right. It wasn't until she finally got pregnant that I learned a hard truth about myself. I didn't want kids, and it turned out. I just wanted Jess. Wanted her in the wholesome, grow old on the porch together kind of way. The pitter-patter of little grams running around was part of the package deal. She needed a future with them in it, just like I needed one with her. We both knew our reasons for being on this rock, both had crystal clear ideas of the futures that we wanted, and we would both do anything to get them. I needed to know that about us before anything else. It'll explain a lot. It's been over a year since I first heard the name, Vermes Regina. That's a lot of months of web searches with no results, countless hours of fruitless research and importantly, Almost 14 months of not contacting the authorities, or even either of our families, when I knew I really should have done. 
That's why it's so vital you understand just how passionate I am. I was about making Jess happy, and how devoted she was to the ascension to motherhood. An ascension her singular underdeveloped and assist-ridden ovary had forever denied her. Or rather, the claim to motherhood she had been denied until Vermes Regina had entered our lives. To start from the start then, Vermes Regina. At first, we thought they were the answers to our prayers. A small miracle that we had endured more than enough disappointment to earn. After years of trying everything from acupuncture to IVF, Jess and I had nearly given up on the idea of having a child. We had even started having conversations about using what remained of our savings on a new house instead of another round of treatment. I had obviously started to consider the possibility that kids weren't in our future long before Jess. However, I had stupidly allowed myself to believe the counseling and grief therapy had been working for her too. She hadn't been crying nearly as often during the five or six months in the run-up to the last night of normalcy that we had. She had even been open to discussions about adopting or fostering for the first time, something that she had always been too far in denial to respond to with anything other than rage. We were so close to moving forward with our life. So close. I remember the night clearly. Jess came running into the living room, waving a leaflet on my face, babbling at a million miles an hour. It was a routine that I had more than gotten used to by that point. Vermes Regina were far from the first company peddling a revolutionary yet experimental new fertility treatment that Jess had unearthed. We had even gone as far as Romania for one, so I was no stranger to suspending my doubts and keeping my skepticism well away from my lips. I know now that's because I didn't actually care whether they succeeded or not. I just wanted Jess to be happy. If visiting quacks and medical charlatans for the rest of my days was what it took to have that porch and rocking chair dream, then so be it. That being said, I was skeptical of this particular offer. There was a bit of an argument that night, well, a lot of an argument. We had already spent so much money on expensive procedures that had yielded no results, and as I said, I genuinely felt that Jess was on the verge of turning a corner and channeling her need to offer motherly affection into a path with less resistance. I don't have to spell out for you who won that little spot. Jess was beyond insistent, especially since the treatment was being offered completely free of charge. Now I know what you're thinking. Free treatment, that's a big red flag. That's what I told her, but she informed me through very gritted teeth that one of our many doctors had passed on our information to Vermes Regina and that they had contacted us directly. I made it very clear how I wanted to get about this breach of medical trust from whichever provider had spilled our very private beings. But Jess made it clear that if I did, she would be getting very litigious about the future of our marriage. To cut a long screaming match short, we were in an office at Vermes Regina Clinic the following Saturday. Jess hadn't been lying. The treatment at the small but surprising the state-of-the-art clinic would be entirely free of charge. One of those, we need more confirmed successes before we can start offering this for money, so you're actually doing us a favor type of con. The only catch was that we would have to agree to use the doctor's ends stay as inpatients at the research clinic until the birth. The doctor informed us that, such was the importance of the treatment, that we would be fully financed during this time, and the level of compensation would far exceed either of our salaries. I was hesitant about these terms for many reasons, mainly because they were obviously far too good to come without a massive hitting catch but Jess was convinced that taking a chance on Vermes Regina was a small risk for the payoff of a possibility of finally becoming parents. In the end, I reluctantly agreed to proceed, and we had moved into the clinic the following week, with Jess undergoing the treatment two days later. As for exactly what the fertilization treatment entailed, I still don't know. None of the nurses or doctors had told me anything about the procedure, Citing patient confidentiality. It's an excuse that I've got used to hearing about far too many things this past year, to be honest. 
It's only since the birth that I became fully aware of it. But the staff here do their absolute best to ignore my existence unless I directly interfere with them. And even then, the interactions are disdainful on their part. Bordering on, I noticed, worrying me too late, outright hostile. Jess still hasn't told me what happened in that room. I do know that they never asked for a sperm sample for me, or any genetic information of mine to pass on. Something that I kept bringing up for a good few weeks before Jess told me in no uncertain terms that I needed to shut up and stop questioning our good fortune. She wasn't right from the day of the treatment until finding out the fertilization had stuck though. I noticed a lot of things that she did her best to hide. Her crying in the shower, the cuts on her legs, the multiple pairs of bloodied underwear stuffed at the bottom of the hamper. I kept quiet about all of it. She was suffering for what she wanted and all I wanted was her, so I was willing to suffer too. In hindsight, suffering in silence for the woman that I love was the most harmful thing that I ever did to her. As it was, my worries about the hows and whys were thrown out the window when we got the news. Jess and I were over the moon and then some when we found out that she was pregnant. After 15 years and many more thousands of dollars, it felt like nothing short of a small miracle. Definitely enough of an emotional high to make me put my doubts aside for several months and willfully ignore the many signs something was amiss. We spent hours poring over baby name books and discussing what kind of parents that we wanted to be. However, our excitement quickly turned to worry, even for Jess, when the quote-unquote morning sickness had kicked in. We had been expecting it as our near success 10 years prior meant that we weren't in total unfamiliar territory with pregnancy and how Jess's body handled it. This time, the morning sickness wasn't just a little bit of nausea though, nor was it the intense but brief thunder chunders that took her last time. It was full-blown vomiting that lasted for hours on end, sometimes long into the night. I remember holding her hair back as she retched into the toilet until the bowl was filled with a little bit of phlegmy bile and browned blood, feeling as helpless and scared as I just looked. The Vermes Regina, midwives, and doctors, however, were unperturbed. They met every one of our requests for treatment. We tried everything to alleviate her symptoms. Ginger tea, crackers, even prescription medication, but nothing seemed to work. All were obliged with a smile from the clinic staff, but never was there any worry about Jess's health or the state of the pregnancy. Jess was losing weight and went for several days without eating at one point. We had both been on cloud nine when we saw that little plus on the pea stick that Vermis Virginia had provided. But even Jess had started to worry that something was seriously wrong after a week or two of the intense sickness and worrying the unintense response to it from our carers. Little did we know that the worst was yet to come. The morning sickness was one thing, but still at least within the realms of things that happen to people when they're pregnant, even if the extremes of it had me locked in a state of paranoia. The night terrors, though. The night terrors were when I really started to catch on that our situation might be incredibly messed up. They started a couple of months into the treatment. Jess would wake up after screaming for hours, shaking and drenched in a cold sweat. And that wasn't the worst part of it. The worst part was when she would look down and realize that she had been scratching at her stomach in her sleep. Not scratching like she was trying to get an itch either. Scratching in a way that meant her fingertips left sticky red prints around her mouth when she clapped her hands to it and wailed upon waking. I never had to ask what the nightmares were about, what she would scream in her while my attempts at waking her or stopping her clawing hands failed, gave me all the details that I could stomach. Bodies and bodies by the billions, small furries scratching over each other in an endless sea of writhing hairy flesh, a sea that just spent night after night dreaming she was drowning in. At least Vermes Virginia took the night terrors a little more seriously than they did the sickness. They arranged for Jess to have in-house psychotherapy immediately, after her first night of sleep-induced self-mutilation. I didn't complain, as it definitely helped. 
whatever they were talking about in those sessions, I reasoned it was working. She would be docile and tranquil for hours after. And even the sickness that dominated most of her waking hours didn't seem to bother her as much. Yeah, no crap. This should have been a massive warning sign for me to get the heck out of there with her. I'm not going to spend even more of my time justifying why I was so stupid to do that. If you don't have any reason to be suspicious, you really don't question why both your wife and her doctors insist that you shouldn't be present at the examinations. Excuses like patient confidentiality and would you respect my privacy, Graham, fly much straighter. And to my credit too, I was beyond exhausted. I was up with Jess night and day doing the basic care that I'm sure orderlies and nurses would provide at any normal hospital. For months, the times that Jess was whisked away from some kind of clandestine checkup were literally the only hours of sleep that I had. To say that I wasn't incentivized to be curious about why the father of the baby shouldn't be present for any scans or updates on the development of their unborn child is an understatement. And then everything changed. One night was all that it took about two months before the birth. I was fully aware that I had stumbled into a nightmare after that. Way too late to do anything about it. It was the first night in a week that Jess had slept for more than a few hours without the fever dream consuming her. I knew something was wrong straight away because when I was awoken by the sounds of her frantic yells, they weren't coming from the damp, sweat-drenched spot in the bed next to me. They were coming from the bathroom. She had locked herself in, crying and screaming, and I had no idea what to do. My best idea was to hammer in the door for a solid hour, yelling her name over and over again, which, despite being the worst plan imaginable, seemed to work. I still can't forget the sight of her, standing there in that far too pristine bathroom, shivering from both sobs and lost hemoglobin. Her face, how it was pallid and yellowish, her usual luminous hair clung to her moist face in greasy, sweaty strands. I remember the redness between her legs, the drops of it leading to the toilet, the trail that left her eyes to follow burn forever into the dark places that my mind can wander if left unchecked. I remember looking into the bowl. I remember hearing my own startled yelling like it was coming from half a world away from somebody else's lips. I don't remember much after that, not of that night at least. It happened many times since though, but unfortunately, Jess was too far along with her quote-unquote psychotherapy sessions to be as alarmed about it as she should have been. The first time it happened was probably the last time I looked Jess in the eye and saw the love of my life as I knew her staring back. They had her after that, I think. She went along with her feel that was all normal and natural. I wasn't buying it though even before the birth. There was no way that they could spin it. Human urine isn't supposed to be filled with clumps of clotted animal fur. And it wasn't just the fur itself that was a sign of how messed up our situation actually was though. Jess's response to it after the first time or rather lack of was another clue. I would still get flashes of the Jess that I knew but they were few and far between. While she would spend the days ignoring me and muttering while occupied with digging out clumps of matted and non-human hair from her intimate areas during the day. At night, she would have flashes of lucidity. Panicked, pained lucidity. But lucidity all the same. It was during the last few weeks of the pregnancy that things started getting really messed up. The first time it happened, I was already awake and in the process of trying to save Jess's belly from another mauling. Without warning, she sat bolt upright and clutched her stomach. The baby, it's kicking, but it's not right. I didn't know what she meant at first, but then I saw the look of panic and distress on her face. It was refreshing in a twisted way. It was the most human look that I had seen on her face in days. I didn't have to pry about what she meant either. Her belly was distended and writhing. The abnormally fast-paced and volatile movements within stretching and stressing the rat left by Jess's sleeping self. I would only ever see a baby kicking in that belly once before, a decade ago. But I had replayed the memory so much that it was ingrained in the inside of my eyelids. 
The kicking from Jess's second pregnancy was nothing like her first, and I hope for the sake of pregnant people everywhere, it's nothing like theirs either. I put my hand on her stomach and I felt it too, a frenzy, a scratching movement that was unlike any baby kick that I had ever felt before. It was almost like something was trying to claw its way out from the inside. Jess was breathing hard, tears streaming down her face. Graham, it's not human, she whispered. It's something else, something terrible. Tell them to get it out of me. Please, Graham, get it out of me. Use your hands if you have to. Just get it out of me, Graham. I had to wrench my wrists from her grasp as she forced them up against the writhing bulge protruding from her waist. Despite myself, I tried to calm her down, telling her that it was just a normal part of pregnancy. I lied to her, basically. Lied because my memory of how badly she wanted to hold a child of her own in her arms overrode all evidence our current predicament would not have that outcome. Lied because I was terrified of looking her in the eye if she lost this child too. Because I couldn't see how to salvage our marriage if she ended up getting a termination because of advice that I had given her. Even if in the moment she agreed with the decision, I know that I was too much of a coward to entrust that time wouldn't change her perspective or fester resentment. And worst of all, I lied because when it boiled down to it, I was willing to do anything to safeguard those dreams of rocking chairs and I knew, or at least I foolishly believed in my state of sleep-deprived poor judgment, that we had to get to the Vermis Regina finish line for that to happen. Of course, the kicking of unnaturally thin limbs pushing themselves six, seven, eight inches out of Jess's belly didn't trouble the Vermis Regina doctors who arrived once I had pulled the bedside alarm cord. They told us that everything was fine and that some babies just kicked more than others. Jess and I united in our assertion that that was a lie. For the first time in months, it felt like she was with me again. Of course, the camaraderie lasted about as long as it took them to arrange her an emergency psychotherapy session. Weird thing though, none of the sessions seemed to help with her nocturnal terrors. Her nightmares got much, much worse. She would wake up nearly a dozen times each night in a cold sweat, screaming about endless oceans of furry bodies, writhing masses of warming tails, and uncountable sets of gnashing yellow teeth. And all the while I could feel the scratchy kicks of the thing inside of her, growing stronger with each passing rotation of the earth as a rival day approached. And during the last week, I lost it. The situation became too much, even for me with my porch retirement life goal as an anchor. I decided to yank the assistance cord and not stop until the Vermes Regina doctors gave me some answers. I screamed at the two burly slabs of meat in white coats when they arrived, demanded to know more about the treatment that they had used to get Jess pregnant, threatening all kinds of harm, unless they told me what the heck was in my wife's stomach. However, instead of the usual defensive, evasive non-answers, my questions were met with a rock-solid weight connecting with my face. The mountain of muscle that hit me crouched down to the floor that he had put me on, speaking very slowly and plainly so his message didn't get misconstrued. To my shock, the doctor made it very clear that they could induce a miscarriage if I continued to ask too many questions. I remember the color and warmth draining from my face, my pulse skipping several beats. For a few moments, the doctor and I stared each other down, the silence broken only by the muttering of Jess, removing clumps of bloodied fur from herself. They had me and he knew it. Vermes Regina were smart. They clearly hadn't ignored me at all. They knew exactly which button to press to get my compliance. There was no way I would let myself be responsible for things ending this close to the due date. This was Jess's last chance at true happiness. To find the fulfillment in her own life that she brought into mine on the day we met. They knew threatening to kill me wouldn't matter to me. Threatening to kill and Jess's happiness though. That's a different story. As terrified as I was of what cost that happiness came at, with that kind of blackmail leverage, there is little they couldn't have had me do. 
I knew in my heart that Jess would rather die now than grow old without being a mother. I selfishly coveted our companionship too much to be the reason she faced a prolonged unsatisfied life with me instead of a short but determined one, doing everything in her power to live her purpose. I didn't have to suffer the indignity of my failure for long though. Barely ten minutes after the doctor broke my nose for asking too many questions and delivered the terms for my child's safe arrival on earth, Jess went into labor. Amazingly, our benefactors at Vermes Regina allowed me to be present for the birth, all 96 hours of it. I'll spare you a blow-by-blow -blow account because in all honesty, my mind has blocked out most of it. What I can remember are just flashes, just enough for my mind to be 100% sure that the memories it's hiding for me are hidden for my own good. I don't have to remember it in full to know that. It was the most horrifying thing that I have ever witnessed. A small army of nurses and midwives, surgeons, and general orderlies were in attendance. I can still hear their chanting when I try to drift off to sleep. An endless drone of almost words, a migraine-inducing throaty hymnal that undercut Jess's agonized, guttural howls for every single hour of the near 96 of them I spent strapped to the chair. They wouldn't let me out of the chair. I was half-starved and dehydrated to the point of being on death's door when the baby finally came, but they never loosened the straps. They never let me out of the chair. Didn't matter how much of my time in the candlelight I spent thrashing and writhing against the thick leather wrist and ankle belts like a half-rabid ghoul. They never let me out of the chair. Everyone had their place and role in the arrival, myself included. The chair was where I needed to be, never out of the chair. I'm amazed that I still had the energy to scream by the end of the fourth day. I did, though. It nearly finished me off, but... I still managed to bellow so loudly that the doctor's perpetual litany of unpronounceable eldritch blasphemy faltered a little. The chair was bolted to the floor opposite the bed. I had managed to catch a brief glimpse of Jess when they had strapped me in during the first hour, her legs up high in stirrups, her form quivering and trembling on silk sheets. A consistent stream of fluids viscous with a non-human hair oozing from the opening south of her bump. However, shortly after our arrival, she had been closed off from my view by the circle mantra reeling medical staff. So I had spent most of the four days staring at the backs of their hooded heads. I don't know what I had expected to see Jess cradling in her arms when the circle finally parted and I was allowed to look upon my wife again. Whatever I had imagined it definitely wasn't anywhere near as bad as what I actually saw. What I could still see right up until this morning when one of the nurses had a change of heart and decided to leave this. This organization or cult or movement or whatever the heck Vermis Regina is. Taking me with them and dumping me unceremoniously outside in ER. When I first saw her in her postpartum state, Jess was in all but one detail the picture-perfect paragon of freshly acquired motherhood. All the pain of the last four days had gone from her face. It had been replaced only by the glowing warmth as she gazed down at the new life cradled in her bosom. The wet, slick, furry thing suckling at her with its warm light tail coiled around her arm. I actually managed to stop screaming, sobbing and spitting venomous curses at her captors. No, it only my captors now for a moment. That moment only came because I puked. There, feeding from my wife, umbilical cords still connecting to the shadowy wound between her stirruped legs, was a rat. A mangy, beady-eyed, foamy-mouthed rat the size of a human toddler. My yelling didn't stop when one of the chanting doctors cut the cord. It didn't stop when I saw Jess. A tired happiness in her eyes, bent forward to begin licking her own amniotic fluid from her new child's fur. Nah, I stopped screaming only at a very specific point. It was when I had passed out from blood loss, which came way too far into the experience of my wife's newborn rat child, slathering across and off the bed, skittering toward the chair, 
and nine through my left ankle. That was a few weeks ago. I've lost one leg up to the thigh, the other one to the shin, an entire arm and the ability to have more children in the time since. Jess gleefully cooed her affection and approval while the rat consumed them all. The worst part is that I had spent the entire time pleading with Jess, asking her both to let me go and to kill me at various points. She just smiled at this vacant smile with the sleeping rat child in her lap and would say stuff like, You're such a good father, Graham, or every family has its ups and downs. I'm only still alive because one of the nurses got cold feet. At least I'm guessing that's what happened. Someone got me out of there and that's the only plausible explanation that I have. They came to me one night while Jess and that that thing were sleeping, ripped the nutrient fluid IV drip from my arm and unbuckled me from the chair before I really knew what was happening. And by the time that I came back around properly, it was weeks later and I was in a normal hospital. The cops surprisingly believe most of my story. Obviously, Jess had a job and we have friends and family. We had informed our people that we would be going away and wouldn't be in contact, but not for anywhere near as long as we were actually gone. Jess and I both had been long reported missing, so the police were open to pretty much everything. Everything, that is, except the truth of it. The most important truth. The child itself, that rat that consumed my future and the call that put it in my wife. They're going to search for Jess and are treating it as a cartel-related kidnapping. Their assessment is that Jess and I had been unfortunate enough to head south of the border and be at the wrong clinic at the wrong time. Jess was, by their most informed guess, had taken his payment for a doctor's debt with men of ill reputation, and my injuries were inflicted on me when I tried to stop them. A tale as old as time, they said. Ignoring the fact that I'm pretty sure this incredibly stereotyped tale as old as time has never actually happened to anybody else either, does the fact that both our passports were still in our apartment when the police searched it matter? Of course it doesn't. The parts of my account which actually matter they believe I have invented is some kind of post-traumatic hallucination, including the company Vermis Regina and the clinic. I know the truth though. They can search for Jess all they want. They'll never find her, here or south of the border. Jess doesn't want to be found. Jess isn't missing. She's more found than she ever was during our marriage. She's found her purpose now, and I gave her the happiness I always promised her that I one day would throughout our 15 years of trying to have kids. All it cost me was most of my limbs, my dreams, and her. Honestly, Having kids was the worst decision I ever made. It was stupid and immature. I'll be the first to admit that. But it's not like I did anything bad to anyone. If you want to try to understand things from my perspective, there was really no way that I could not do it. First, because his name was Mr. Hillrow. Second, because he acted like an idiot. I'm always calling on you the one day you didn't do the reading, and then dragging out the embarrassment in front of the whole class. And third, he sort of looked like a you-know-what, with his ring of puffy hair surrounding the bald top of his head. It was like I had to do it. I got Billy's older brother, a previous student of Mr. Horo, to give me the you-know-what. Then, before class started, I stood it up on Mr. Hillrow's desk. I taped a pair of tiny glasses to the head, wrapped a tiny necktie around it, and propped up a little name tag that read, Mr. Hillrow, but with a D instead of the R. At first, everyone laughed, and then Mr. Hillrow got upset and started yelling in a scary way, demanding to know who had done it. The class got real quiet. Nobody ratted me out. I gave myself away. I took another look at Mr. Hillrow and I started cracking up again. So, uh, that's how I ended up in detention. But it was only supposed to be for three afternoons. 
not three years. The school is different at night. It didn't take long at all for me to find that out. The first afternoon of my detention went about like you would expect. I had to sit there and read that book about the giant whale. It took everything I had not to make another joke, because Mr. Hillrow was sitting at his desk, just angrily glaring at me the whole time. At four on the nose, Mr. Hillrow stood up. I grabbed my backpack, ready to get the heck out of there. Your actions are unspeakably vulgar, said Mr. Hillrow. I thought about the name tag again, and almost lost it from the effort of not cracking up. Mr. Hillrow went on. You will stay here through the night, and reflect upon the proper manner in which to conduct yourself while enrolled in this educational institution. And then he flicked off the light switch and left the room. That threw me for a loop, but I shrugged it off, stood up and went to get out of there. The door was locked. What the heck? Okay, Mr. Hillrow. I shouted through the door. I looked through the little window at the top and saw the back of his half-bald mushroom head as he walked down the hall. You got me, I gotta hand it to you. That's a good one. I've definitely learned my lesson. Mr. Hillrow disappeared around the corner. I stood staring out of that little window for about 15 minutes, before it started to dawn on me that the guide really meant to keep me locked in that room all night. I wasn't even mad at him. He had got to me. When I pulled out my phone to call my parents, it wasn't to rat him out. It was because I had no intention of staying in that room all night. No reception. I hadn't told my parents about detention, but knowing them, I figured they would put the pieces together soon enough. They would start calling my friends who did know about detention. I just hoped my friends wouldn't feel like they were ratting me out by telling my parents where I was. I walked over to the exterior window and held my phone up to it. Still, no reception. I tried to open the window, but it was jammed shut. I looked down to the parking lot below. People were leaving for the day. I thought about breaking the window and jumping for it, but I was on the second floor and it was way too far down into the pavement. Plus, I knew I would just get a bunch of crap for breaking school property. I tried to flick on the light switch, but the light didn't come on. And then, for the next hour, I did something that I'll never forgive myself for. I burned through my phone's battery playing some dumb game. I don't even remember what. As my phone lost battery, I looked up and noticed that the room was dark. The light coming through the window was getting dimmer and dimmer. It started to feel really eerie. I banged on the door for a while, trying to get someone's attention, but no one came. As the last bit of light faded away, I took one last look outside through the window. The parking lot was now empty. Now the room was very dark. I started to panic. I did not want to spend the night in that room, but it was looking like I didn't have a choice. After a bit of mindless pacing, I heard a click and the door to the classroom slowly swung open to the hallway, seemingly of its own accord. Hello? I asked into the darkness. Mr. Hillrow, look, I've learned my lesson, really I have. I'm truly sorry for doing what I did. It was dead quiet, and I didn't see anybody there. That creeped me out, but I was happy to get out of the room at least. I walked down the hall, which was now lit up by a few dim lights up at the top of the wall. I knew where I was headed first, the bathroom. I'd had to go for like an hour and it was getting me now. I had thought about just taking it out and going all over Mr. Hodo's desk, but I figured that would only get me in more trouble. I was walking past a long roll of lockers when I heard it. It started as a slight rattle coming from one of the lockers. I tried to play it off as just the building settling or something, but then another locker door started to rattle, and then another and another and soon the whole row was rattling. When I heard a scraping sound, 
like something sharp being dragged against the metal of the locker doors, followed by what sounded like a low growl. That's when my urge to go to the bathroom was suddenly relieved, right down my leg. It's also when I started running like heck. As I ran down the hall, the rattling turned into banging. Now I could see the locker door shaking, straining against the hinges and latches. Whatever terrible things were inside were on the verge of breaking free. All at once, the horrible sounds coming from the locker stopped, just as I came to the end of the hall. I didn't slow down though. I booked it down the stairs and only felt the slightest bit of relief. When I saw the entrance to, and more importantly the exit from, the school in front of me, I ran a full speed towards the door, putting my hands in front of me to push it open. A thunk. My wrist twisted painfully as it impacted the unmoving door. Of course it's locked, you idiot. It's nighttime. I tried to find a deadbolt latch or something, but there wasn't one. Just a keyhole. Why the heck do all these doors lock from the outside? I wondered. As I slumped down to the ground in pain, fearing what was beginning to look like utter defeat, I pulled my phone out of my pocket. Now that I was by the front entrance, I might get reception. If I hadn't been a dang idiot and used up all of my battery. I held the power button for a full five minutes straight before I gave up and put the use of this thing back in my pocket. I felt like crying. It was bad enough just being locked in there, but being locked in there with a bunch of locker monsters and who knows what else was much, much worse. I decided to stick by the front entrance and wait it out. I sat there in soil pants for hours. I would start to get bored and even a little sleepy. And then I would hear a noise from somewhere in the school and it would jolt me into full alertness. Sometimes it was a soft rustling sound that I wasn't quite sure I was actually hearing. And sometimes it was a loud, unmistakable bang. Once I was sure that I had heard someone laughing. Finally, it got to the point where I couldn't ignore how hungry I was. The cafeteria was right by the entrance, so I figured I could risk it. I didn't have any money for the vending machine, but I thought that I might be able to get into the kitchen and scrounge up some food. I had always wondered what the heck went on in there anyway. I turned the corner and was surprised to see that the cafeteria was brightly lit. I could smell something delicious wafting out from there. I took a cautious step and was shocked to see Miss Hadley, aka the lunch lady, standing there behind the counter in her hairnet. Young man, she said when she saw me, you're just in time. Miss Hadley, what are you doing here? I asked. It's the middle of the night. The lunch lady laughed. Oh, sometimes when I can't sleep, I come down here and try out a new recipe. And tonight, oh boy, I've come up with something out of this world. I think the children will love it. Something clicked in my adult mind. So you have a key? I asked. You can let me out of here. Of course I have a key, Sully. But before you go, won't you try my newest dish? You look hungry. She was right about that. I mean, I was ready to get the heck out of there. But at least now I knew that I could get out of there. I didn't see the harm in chowing down first. Especially since it smelled so good. I grabbed a tray and I held it out to her. Behind the counter, she scooped some mashed potatoes onto a plate. And then put a cut of juicy steak on there too. She put the plate on my tray. Thanks, I said. Let me know what you think, she said, smiling. I sat down and dug into the mashed potatoes. Dang, they were good. Just the right balance between fluffy and creamy, and a hint of garlic to top it off. And then I cut off a chunk of steak and I put it in my mouth. It was wonderful, but it didn't taste like any steak that I had ever had before. Wow, I said. This is great. What is it? Meat, said the lunch lady. Oh yeah, I figured. What I meant was, what kind of? 
A scream coming from back in the kitchen cut me off. Uh, Miss Hadley, can I go now? You don't like your meat, young man, asked Miss Hadley, frowning. Oh, no, it's great. It's just my parents are probably worried sick about me. I've been stuck here all night. Mr. Hillrow locked me in. Another scream. Oh, what's that screaming? I asked. No, that'll be Lily, my assistant, said Miss Hadley. She's forever burning herself, and if it isn't that, it's a slip of the knife. Clumsy girl, but has a great instinct for cooking. Oh, Miss Hadley, can I please go? Very well, young man, I'll see you to the door. Just what I wanted to hear, a way out of the nightmare. When I got home, I would hug my parents, and then get in bed where it was nice and safe and sound and there were no weird sounds, or locker monsters or mystery meats. When we turned the corner and the entrance came into view, my heart first sank and then started beating like crazy. Standing in front of the door, with his arms crossed, was the janitor. Except, he didn't look like he looked during the day. During the day, he didn't have a bunch of spikes coming out of his head, for starters. And he also didn't have empty white holes where his eyes should be. He didn't have long claws during the day either. At least none that I had ever noticed. I let the boy pass, Bob, said Miss Hadley. When Bob the janitor spoke, the sound didn't come out of his mouth. I was standing there facing him, and I heard his voice whispering behind me. I'm afraid I can't do that, Miss Haley. The boy shall not pass. Direct orders from you-know-who. Everything started to spin, and I felt woozy. Uh, come on, dude, I groaned. I gotta get home. I'm sorry about the prank, if that's what this is about. I'll never do anything like that again, I promise. I looked past the janitor monster and saw that it was starting to get light out. Even if I didn't make it out right then, it would only be a few more hours until school opened. And then I heard a hiss and I looked up in horror to see some kind of gas coming out of the air vents in the ceiling. And then I was out cold. So much crazy stuff has gone down in this crazy school building over the past three years. If I ever make it out of here, I'll tell the full story. But dawn is approaching and I don't have much time left. I'll give you the basics. Every day around dawn, the gas pours in through the vent and knocks me out. There's no way to stop it. I've tried. Next, I wake up in a dark room, which is actually a sort of sub-basement dug into the basement floor and covered with a hidden hatch door during the day. That night, the hatch opens, and I am free to wander the halls of the school if I choose. I never want to, but I have needs. I need to eat and use the bathroom. I need to shower in the locker room. I need to wash my clothes. I need to try and find a way out of this nightmare, even if it looks more and more like there is no way out. Plus, as bad as it is out in the school, it's miserable in my dark little hole too. If I stay there too long, I start to lose it. I have some theories about what is going on, but I won't get into them. A bit of light is coming in through the windows now. It's almost time for my lights to go out for the day. I'm at the computer lab now. I have very limited access to the internet, and it seems pretty random what sites I can and can't visit. I can't read any news, so I don't even know if anyone's out there looking for me. Or if my entire existence has been forgotten since I got trapped in this place. Lately, I've come across this forum. This is, for some reason, the only place that I can read. I don't even know if I can post, but it's worth a shot. You guys seem like you've dealt with a lot of weird stuff. So maybe you'll take this seriously. Please help me. My name is Emmett Emerson. I am at CHAS in Claremont, Maine, United States. During the day, I'm in the sub-basement if you can find it. During the night, if you can somehow get in and make it past the janitor, I'm usually somewhere running away from monsters. Hi everyone, 
My name is Emmert Emerson, and I am stuck in what has to be the world's worst school detention. Regular detention sucks enough already, but I've been here for three years. Also, they keep me in a hole in the basement and usually only let me out at night. And at night, the monsters come out too. I don't mean that figuratively. I saw one of them take a kid's face off once. That wasn't in my last post, but his name was Jason. And just when I thought that we could team up and get out of this place, he wandered a little too close to one of the windows, and a wrangler got him. I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry about that. I'm just psyched that my last post actually made it through, and a flood of people responded. I've got hope for the first time in at least a year. And does it suck that some of you are telling me that there is no record of me existing online? You bet it does. Is it bad that some of you are telling me that my school burned down recently and that I went down with it? Again, yes, it stinks very much. I don't know if you're messing with me or if that stuff is true, but either way, it's at least good to hear from actual people again. Assuming you are real, this isn't just a trick set up by the school. The lunch lady isn't so bad, but uh, she's a little out there. And Jason, like I said, I didn't get to know Jason very well before he got his face taken. Other than that, it's been mostly me, all alone with monsters for the past three years. Some others have come and gone, usually in a horrible way, but mostly I've been alone. So, if you read my last post, thank you. And thank you for trying to help. A lot of you offered up ways that I might escape. I've been here three years and I've tried pretty much everything that you guys have suggested. Some of these stuff took me years to come up with, so I'm kind of blown away that you all came up with it right away. If you were here as long as me, I'm sure a lot of you would have already found a way out by now. I thought about responding to all of the comments, but I figured it would be best to just continue my story. That way, you can see more of what I'm up against, and maybe you'll come up with some more theories and suggestions. So, here is how the second night went. When I woke up that second night, I had no idea where I was. I was at groggy from the gas and it was pitch black. I started shouting for help. My voice went as soon as it left my mouth, sucked in by the walls of the room that I was in. I mean, I could hear myself, but there was absolutely no reverb. It was like the darkness was swallowing up the sound. I knew in my gut that nobody could hear me. After a few minutes, the memories of the previous night started to trickle in, and I felt the terror all over again. In one second, I was looking at the janitor, with those horrible crooked spikes growing out of his skull, and the next I was here. I kept shouting even though I knew it was useless, because it was all that I could do. After a few minutes, I heard a loud creak and a hatch door above my head slowly opened up. I wasted no time in crawling my way out of that hole. I found myself in what I assumed was the basement of the school. It was dark in there, but I could see the boiler in the corner, with a bunch of little neon lights buzzing away. I looked around in the darkness a bit for something useful, but it seemed like mostly junk. And then I saw it pressed up against the wall. I wetted myself for the second time in two nights. I could see the dark outline of massive claws and several insect-like legs. I took a step back and almost had a heart attack when I bumped into an old desk. Where are the stairs? I wondered, not idly. And then the room was suddenly flooded with lights, and I almost laughed. It was an old dusty Louis the Lobster costume. Louis was our school mascot. Just this ridiculous, lumbering, fuzzy red thing. I turned around and saw the stairs. I was halfway there when I heard the snap. I whipped my head around. There was nothing there, just a bunch of old, useless junk. I'm starting to lose it, I told myself. Understandably so. I gotta get out of the school. I kept walking to the stairs and this time I heard two snaps and a skittering noise. Now when I turned around, I saw Louis the Lobster crawling towards me. His pinchers were going wild, 
open and enclosing and hungry. I watched in a mixture of disbelief and horror as he crushed the desk that I had just bumped into between his mighty claws. The desk splintered into thousands of pieces. I ran, taking these stairs two at a time. I heard a crunch and I felt the railing wobble. When I looked back, I saw that Louis had begun pulling himself up the railing, digging in with his claws and pushing off with his many legs, and he was moving fast. I had made it to the door just in time. I could feel the air rushing behind my butt as the snap of Louis' claws were silenced by the closing door. I kept running down the hall and back towards the entrance. I would break that door down if I had to. When I got to the door, I almost added some solid waste to go along with what was already in my pants. The janitor was there, mopping the floor, whistling away. His back was to me, and I was at least relieved to see that there were no spikes coming out of his head. But when he turned to look at me, I saw those same two empty white holes where his eye should be. Can't walk here, bub, he said in that crazy whisper that didn't actually come from his mouth. Wet floor, not safe. I didn't need any more convincing. No way was I prepared to take on the janitor. At least not then. I backed away, my mind whirling. The lunch lady, I thought. I mean, sure, she had fed me a cut of what was almost certainly human, but at least she had seemed willing to help me get out of here. I ran to the cafeteria. The lights were on, but I didn't see anybody there. Hello? No answer. I looked around and saw a tray of steaming food on one of the tables. There is a note next to it. I walked over and read it. A growing boy needs his strength. Need up, my dear. This is my best creation yet. On the tray was a big plate of some more of those awesome mashed potatoes, some beans and some kind of soup. The soup was green, and something was floating on top. I didn't look closely enough to determine if it was a baby carrot or a finger. I picked up the bowl of soup and put it on a different table. And then I sat down and dug into the mashed potatoes and beans. It was all so delicious. I wolfed it all down. Now what? I wondered. The windows. The previous evening, I had been too chicken to jump out of a second story window when Mr. Hillrow locked me into one of the classrooms. But way back then, I thought that I would just be here for a few hours. If I had known I was facing three years at least, I would have dove head first letting the glass shards cut me up and letting me break a bone or two just to get out. I was ready to get out, and I was on the first floor, so I wouldn't have to worry about the broken bones part. I finished up the lunch lady special, or at least everything except the green soup, and I took my tray to the trash can. I decided on room 108. I had algebra there, and I knew that there is a big, tall window in that room. I crept on the hall, trying to sneak past the janitor, who was still pretending to mop that same spot on the floor. The boy shall not pass, he said from behind me. Thanks, dude. I made it to room 108 and I tried the door. It was unlocked. As soon as I had entered, the lights turned on. The first thing that I saw was the chalkboard. There is a piece of freaking chalk just floating in the air writing out a message, and it said, A is for atrocity, B is for because, C is for child, D is for dared, E is for escape, and F is for, I think you know. I tried my best to pretend that I hadn't just seen that, and I turned to the window. What I saw there made the whole chalkboard thing look like a stroll in the park. Standing in front of the window was a hideous creature, with gray and scaly skin, standing about as tall as an adult person. But it wasn't a person. It had maybe a dozen arms, like tentacles almost, like a cross between tentacles and arms, just writhing away, feeling around. The thing had no eyes, but it had a nose, or rather, two flat, oblong holes where the nose should be, and a mouth. 
A red tongue wiggled over crooked and sharp-looking fangs, like a worm dancing on knives. When I saw that first wrangler, at least that's what I call them, I went in my pants again for the third time altogether. I booked it out of room 108, my mind screaming for some kind of way out. A phone, I thought. There's gotta be a phone. Uh, I know there is in the office. And getting into the office meant that I would have to pass by the janitor again. But his job just seemed to be blocking the front door, so I thought that I had a chance. At the school, there is a reception desk out in the open, right by the main entrance. Just behind it is the main office, and that's where they do the announcements. I figured there had to be a phone there. I mean, you call the school, then somebody's got to answer it, right? I kicked myself for not thinking it through the night before. I had wasted hours just sitting by the front entrance, waiting for school to open up again. It doesn't matter, I told myself. You figured it out now, and that's all that counts. I snuck past the janitor and I made it to the door of the front office. There was a little window in the door, the same as most of the other doors in the school. I looked in and I couldn't see anything. It was dark in there. My brain screamed, too dark. Just as my hand was on the doorknob, I noticed a pinprick of light coming from inside the room. And that's when it hit me. It wasn't dark inside the room at all. The door was just covered in spiders. Thousands of pure black spiders. So dense that they looked like darkness itself. I released the door handle and I took a step back. I've always been terrified of spiders. In Maine, most spiders are harmless to humans. But these ones looked really nasty. And given all the other horrors in the school, I figured they would probably paralyze me with one bite and then slowly take me out while I watched helplessly. But still, I had to see if there was a phone in there. I grabbed the door and opened it, just enough to have a look inside. There was a phone in there alright, crawling with spiders just like every other inch of the room. The walls, the ceiling, the floor. Spiders everywhere. On the floor, they were probably about a foot deep, crawling all over each other. Just this undulating black mass of massive hungry spiders. Nope. I gently closed the door and walked away. There has to be another way. I wandered around the school in a terrified state. As I looked around, I saw a wrangler standing in front of each window. Their sickening appendages and doing a slow dance. Reaching and feeling for prey. Windows were out. Unless I felt up to challenging one of those things. The front door was out unless I felt like taking on the janitor. The phone was out unless I could find a huge can of bug spray somewhere. But there had to be another way. What is this nightmare, I wondered. Is this all really because of the prank that I had put on Mr. Hillrow? Eventually, I found myself in the gym. I heard the echoing slap of a basketball repeatedly hitting the court, but I couldn't see anything. Ghost basketball. And the hairs on my neck shot up and I hurried through to the locker room. By then, I was already pretty ripe and I needed to clean up. I walked warily past the row of lockers, remembering the locker monsters from the night before. Each one gave a gentle rattle as I walked past, letting me know they were in there, but not coming for me for the moment. There was an aluminum baseball bat propped up in the corner. I grabbed it and I headed for the showers. I washed myself with one hand while I held the bat in the other, keeping my eyes peeled the whole time. And then I washed my clothes. When I was done, I dried myself off with a towel and dried my clothes off under the hot air blower, meant to dry your hands. It took forever, but by the time I was dressed again, I felt refreshed and ready to take on the whole school and get out of here. And that's when the gas came in through the vent. So, that was night two out of what, a thousand plus? I realize there's not much here to build grand theories on. I just wanted to give you guys more of a sense of what I'm up against here. This school does not want me to leave. As to who or what is behind all of this, I'm not 100% sure. 
Maybe next time I'll jump ahead a couple years and tell you about my time with Jason. That's when a few things started to click together for me, and maybe you guys can help me solve the puzzle. Meanwhile, please keep thinking of ways to help me out of here. It really stinks in here. On that note, I better get moving again. I'm going to try out later for Reddit so that I can post this during the day. I hope it works. And I hope that whatever's clacking its way down the hall towards the computer lab right now doesn't catch me and do something like tear the eyeballs out of my head. It was never good news when the second hatch opened. The first time it happened, Robin Phillips emerged, still looking beautiful despite being covered in sweat and I guess something else. She threw a crazed look around the dark basement. Come on, I said, we better get moving. Who the heck are you? She shrieked, cowering away from me. I sighed. I had had a huge crush on Robin for three years, and now my worst fear was confirmed. She didn't even know I existed. Emmett Emerson, I said. I'm really sorry that this is happening to you, but we have to get out of this basement. There are bad things down here. There are bad things everywhere, but these ones are particularly aggressive. Robin started screaming. Stay away from me. The overhead lights turned on. We have to go right now, I said. Robin started sobbing. What's happening? I'll explain later. Right now, we have to go. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement. A red fuzzy flurry of movement. I grabbed Robin's arm. She bit my hand. Don't touch me, she said. And that was the last thing she had ever said. As Louis the Lobster's a massive claw closed around her waist and cut her nearly in half. And then, there was the kid who refused to come out of his hole. I did what I could for him. I brought him food and water. I told him lies like that everything was going to be okay. I did what I could, but it wasn't enough. One night, I woke up and I looked in his hole and he was no more. And there had been a few others. Darren Fleming, for example, who thought that he could take on the janitor. He couldn't. Darren emptied the fire extinguisher in the janitor's face and then swung the empty canister against the beast's head. None of it did anything, and one headbite from that spiked head was enough to end Darren. Or not exactly. Darren is still here, and so is Robin, and the handful of other kids unlucky enough to end up in this place. They wander the hallways as ghosts, moaning in despair. Even in death, there is no escape from this place. Talk about a crap sandwich. Though I've eaten things here worse even than that. When I saw that second hatch open again, over two years into this nightmare, I thought it was going to be another instant goner. I was at the point where I couldn't allow myself to hope anymore. And it was a terrible feeling knowing that whoever came out of that hole wasn't going to make it very long. I reached down to give him a hand. Even in the dark, I had recognized him. Jason Porter. He had been a freshman when I first got locked up in here, which would make him a junior now. We had talked a few times and he had seemed cool. Listen, Jason, I said. We have to get the heck out of the basement now. Sounds good, said Jason. I headed down to where I could already have my hand around the basement door by the time that the lights flicked on, and Louis the Lobster became animated. Jason slowed me down a little, but we made it out with a time to spare. You mind telling me what the heck is going on? asked Jason, as I closed the basement door behind him. Like for starters... Who are you and how do you know my name? You don't remember me, I asked, disappointed. I thought we had vibed. That was a couple years ago, though. I never seen you in my life, dude, said Jason. And that's when it finally occurred to me. Even if he or the others didn't remember me personally, they had to have heard about my disappearance, right? Claremont, Maine is a small town after all. My name is Emmett Emerson, I said. You haven't heard anything about me. I was a year ahead of you. We had talked a couple of times. 
More than that, I disappeared from the face of the earth a little over two years ago. Didn't ring any bells. Jason shook his head. Wait, he said. Let me guess, detention, right? You got detention with Miss Fathaway, and then you woke up here. Christ, you've been in here for two years? Not Miss Fathaway, I said. Mr. Hillrow. I dressed up a little thing like him and mentioned it as a funny name. But other than that, yeah. Detention, then the monsters, then the gas. Two years of that. Jason was cracking up. What? That's hilarious. The guy is awful. For me, it was just a harmless fart. Okay, it was on somebody, but he thought it was funny too. Wasn't a big deal. But Miss Fathaway lost it. And then she gave me some kind of speech during detention. Locked me in the room and sounds like you know the rest. But if you've been here two years... Gosh. I nodded. The kids seemed to grasp the severity of the situation at least. You hungry? I asked. Uh, let's set up the cafeteria and I'll fill you in. And Jason opened his mouth to respond but no words came out. I saw the color drain out of his face. And then he finally spoke in a whisper. Is that a monster? He asked, pointing. I tensed up and turned to look, and then I relaxed. No, I said, that's just Lily. Lily came hobbling down the hall, dragging the foot that was missing all of its toes behind her. A tray of food balanced dangerously on her one hand. Cafeteria closed again, I said. I'm afraid so, Emmett, said Lily, handing off the tray to me. A fire? I asked. Or rats? A little from column A, a little from column B, said Lily. I looked Lily over carefully. I didn't notice any new body parts missing, which combined with what she had just told me meant that the burgers on the tray were probably from rats. You get used to it. Thanks, Lily, I said. Give our regards to Miss Hadley. Lily hobbled away and we sat down on a bench and caught up while we ate. Cell phone? Asked Jason, taking a big bite of the burger. Mine's dead, I said. Yours? Miss Fathaway took it during detention and then walked off with it. How about landlines, like in the main office? Spiders, I said. Maybe a million of them. I've raided the chemistry room and thrown everything I could find at them. I think they've only gotten bigger, though. Internet, asked Jason, at the computer lab. Very limited, I said. It's a crapshoot on which sites actually work, and I haven't found one yet where you can communicate with people. Windows. Never the windows, I said. Windows are out of the question. Stay away from the windows. Fire alarms, asked Jason. Don't do a thing this time of night. The gas, it comes out of the vents every morning, said Jason. That's right, and I've tried every trick in the book, training myself to hold my breath. I've got up to four minutes, but it wasn't enough. Have you tried leaving notes? asked Jason, like in the lockers. You haven't seen the locker monsters yet, I said. Oh, said Jason, uh, right. I haven't tried it myself, but I saw one girl do it. That was the only glimpse of an actual locker monster that I've gotten. The girl went to slip the note in the little vents there and the door swung open. This tiny green arm shot out of the darkness and pulled her in, slamming the door behind her. I heard her screaming in there. Even tried to open the locker, but it was closed tight. The screaming didn't last long. Oh, said Jason shoveling in a spoonful of mashed potatoes. What about a note somewhere else? Somewhere that's not obvious. I've tried it all. I carved a message into a desk. The next night, I saw that desk down in the basement, and a different one was in its place upstairs. I wrote on the walls in Sharpie. The next night, it's gone. The janitor goes around and cleans everything up. I did write one message that's still there but it's on the underside of Mr. Hillrow's desk. I took out all the drawers and I wrote it there. It works, sure, but who the heck is ever going to see that? 
Jason finished his burger and burped. Well, crap, he said. How's the library looking? Not good, I said. I've only been there a couple of times, I'll just say this. You don't want those bookworms crawling inside you. What they do when they get in, it's not right. And where they come out once, they're ready to leave. Ugh. Jason frowned. What kind of grades were you pulling before you got locked up in here? Uh, C's, pretty much, I admitted. Same here. And we need that library. We're not smart enough to do this on our own. But the bookworms, I said. Well, it sounds like we got a couple of different infestations around here, said Jason. We got the monsters and we got the spiders. Don't see anything we can do about that right now and you haven't already tried. And then we got the bookworms and the rats. What if we catch the rats and then set them out as bait for the bookworms? I had to admit, it was a brilliant plan. I mean, he didn't know that the rats were our only main source of protein, with Lily being a distant second, and I didn't have the heart to tell him just then. So, it was a brilliant plan, and I was glad to have somebody in it with me, who was eager to get the heck out of here with me. But in a smart way, or as smart a way as we could muster between us. Let's do it, I said. We caught hundreds of rats in a big trash can and set them loose in the library, peeking through the window and the door over the course of the week. The rat trick worked. Soon the hundreds of rats were covered in millions of worms. That was our chance to grab a crap load of worm-free books. We didn't know what we were looking for. We had been so reliant on the internet our entire lives. If we ever wanted to know anything, we would just Google it. Now we didn't even know what we wanted to know. We just grabbed a bunch of books that looked like they might be useful. We got books about spiders, books about the paranormal, books about the local history of our town, books on construction, science books, and so on. While I was there, I found a copy of the yearbook from my freshman year. I wasn't in there. I showed it to Jason who found a copy of the yearbook from his freshman year. Neither of us were in it. We collected dozens of books and in a mad dash past Louis the Lobster, dumped half of them down into my hole, and half of them with his, so that we would have them there with us. And after that, we read. We read and we wandered the school, and we talked. Jason had ended up with the local history bits. You know, he said one day, as we passed by the moaning ghost of poor Robin Phillips, I've noticed something really weird. This book I'm reading, it keeps mentioning this one family is sort of starting this town and sort of running things for hundreds of years. The Haldros. Yeah? I asked, making sure to walk in the exact center of the hallway, the maximum distance allowable from the locker monsters on either side of us. Haldro. It doesn't ring any bells. Well, here's the weird thing. There's a lot of sketches of the husband and wife who founded the town. And then, uh, there are photographs of the descendants. And you know who they all kind of look like? I had an idea, but I didn't say it. Who's that? Miss Hillro and Miss Falloway, said Jason. I shuddered. Okay, so... Well, if you take Hillro and Falloway and sort of put them together, it would be kind of like Haldro, right? Okay, I said. I understand, but I still don't see where you're going with this. How'd you even come up with this? Well, there's something else, said Jason. The book is really weird. Most of the time, it stays the same. But at exactly midnight, one of the pages, it changes. It's the one about the way back history. The one with the sketch of the founders of Claremont. Suddenly, the sketch becomes clear. Not like a photograph, but almost. And it's Mr. Hillro and Miss Falloway there. Sure as crap, both looking upset. And then, the words change. Jason swallowed hard and went on. It's not about setting up a shipping route or whatever anymore. Now it's this weird religious stuff. Talking about how God is disappointed in our perversions. And is establishing Claremont as the last refuge for the holy or whatever. 
the violators of God's holy word will be punished for their sins. And to do that, the Haldros are willing to strike a deal with the devil. We pressed up against a wall as we passed a wrangler and Jason finished up. I mean, it's not just the words that change. The whole thing is now written out by hand in this crazy old-timey talk. I've had to read it a bunch over the past three midnights. First, to make sure that it's real, and second, to sort of translate what's being said. I felt dizzy. Okay, I said after a while. So what? Mr. Hillrow and Miss Fathaway are really Mr. and Mrs. Haldrow. And they're what? Immortal beings who have been around for hundreds of years. And this whole BS school is the way of punishing people who fart in class. Is that what you're telling me? Seems a little extreme. Jason shrugged. Uh, the page talks about somebody else too. Not the devil and not a Heldrow. You know who this person is called. Apparently, they're the one running the whole thing, whatever it is. I thought back to my first night there. The janitor had said, The boy shall not pass. Direct orders from you know who. I shuddered again. Good work, man, I said. I've been reading some stuff too. This construction book's got me thinking. Maybe we're taking the wrong approach here. Hoping for an open window or an open door. Maybe what we do is just try to smash through this thing. If all of it is is drywall and insulation, maybe some wires in there, and then brick on the outside. It's pretty simple, actually. Can't believe I didn't think of it before. Maybe because I knew that something would try to stop us. But if there's two of us, I think we could do it. Sounds good, man, said Jason. Let's do it. Over the next week, we planned it out. We found the perfect spot, far away from any windows, any lockers, and the front door. Far away from where the usual monsters lurked. We figured that would give us a head start, and with any luck, we would smash through to fresh air before they came for us. There was always random monsters roaming around like the hall monitor, which was a skeleton with two huge swords that would start running after you as soon as it saw you, to name one. But we couldn't control for that. We had a good plan, but we needed luck too. Our plan after all that time was really simple. We would each grab two baseball bats from the locker room, go to our designated spots and start smashing away. I still think it could have worked, with the two of us. Everything's so much harder when you're alone. But that night, I didn't start out alone. I went to the locker room with Jason and grabbed two bats. I was scared, and I was running on pure adrenaline, trying not to think at all. I was on my way out when Jason stopped me. I've been saving this for a special occasion, he said. He reached behind the lockers where there is a gap between the wall and the back of the lockers and pulled out a bottle of Captain. I figured we needed a little courage tonight. I had only drank a couple of times. I knew that it would give us courage but also make us clumsy. I don't know, man, I said. Don't you think we should be sharp? Sure, said Jason, unscrewing the cap. But not too sharp. What if it comes down to a split second? A monster's coming and we've got just one more brick to smash. If we get scared, we don't make it. This is all or nothing, man. This is it. We've got to be loose for it, you know. I don't know if I agreed or not, but after he finished taking a long drink, I had a nap. It burned the back of my throat, and the warmth spread out inside my body. I had another nip and then handed the bottle back. Okay, I said, feeling the rush. Let's do this. Hold on, said Jason. One more. He tilted the bottle back and took two long swallows. Okay, he said. Let's do it. I led the way, my heart pounding in my chest. This is it, I thought. I'm either getting out of here or this is the end. I heard one of Jason's bats tap against the floor, and I turned around. He was weaving slightly as he walked. Shh, I said. Come on, man. You gotta be quiet. We passed a row of lockers, and I was relieved to see that the locker monsters were no more agitated than usual. I saw the big hall window up ahead, and once we got past that, we were past the stationary monsters. 
but we never made it past that window. Not the two of us anyway. I heard Jason scream as one of his bats clattered to the ground. I clutched both of my bats and turned to look at what I already knew what was happening. The Wrangler had a tentacle arm wrapped around one of Jason's legs, and each of his arms dragged him closer to its hideous eyeless face. I made a step towards them and I swung wildly. The Wrangler caught my bat in one of its tentacle arms and pulled it away from me. There was nothing that I could do. The Wrangler lifted Jason into the air upside down so that their faces were inches apart. It sniffed Jason through its two ungodly nostril holes and then stuck out its red worm tongue and licked him. The Wrangler pulled Jason even closer and I took a swing with my remaining bat, but my weapon was pulled easily from my hands. The Wrangler opened its maw and sunk its fangs into Jason. I watched helplessly with tears streaming down my own face. And Jason's face was gone. And then I was alone again. After Jason was gone, I stayed in my hole for two days, sick with grief. For Jason and for myself. We could have done it together. I can't do it alone. I have worked it through a thousand times in my head. I can't do any of it alone anymore. That's why I'm so grateful for all of you out there reading this, offering suggestions. Like I said, I've tried most of them, but going through the comments, I do see a few ideas that I haven't tried yet. Maybe I'll give them a shot tomorrow night. Meanwhile, writing this has been rough. I think I'm going to go to the locker room and find the rest of that captain. Pour one out for my dude. I'm gonna get out of this nightmare, buddy. And then, I'm gonna track down you-know-who and shut this place down. I farted into the bag, and then I sat down in the seat where it all started. My seat in Mr. Hillrow's class, where I had gotten detention for dressing up a you-know-what to look like him. I took a deep breath from the air around me and held it. I watched the second-hand mover on the clock. One minute, no problem. Two minutes. Not breaking a sweat yet. Three minutes. There's the strain. I knew I could make it to four minutes most of the time. At three minutes and fifty seconds, I opened the bag and I inhaled the fart. When I woke up on the floor, I knew that it wasn't going to work. Apparently, farts don't contain as much oxygen as I had hoped. Well, that stunk. But good to know. It's why I was practicing in the first place. I pulled the paper out of my pocket. I had written down one of the comments from my second post here, because it seemed really smart and fairly safe and was something that I hadn't tried yet. Someone suggested trying to fill garbage bags up with oxygen through a various different ways, so I thought that I would go with that. It was great thinking, but unfortunately, I couldn't make the suggestion work. For starters, we didn't have a shop class. I actually remember my freshman year when Mr. Hillrow led a campaign to end it, claiming that the point of school was to build minds, not to turn students into blue-collar workers. By the way, that's how I first came to know of him as being mean, because by all accounts, shop class was fun and easy. Anyway, I just couldn't grab an oxygen tank from a welding rig in shop class. As far as creating a reaction in the chemistry lab went, I just didn't have the necessary stuff. Every so often, I would go around throwing various liquids and powders from there on various lesser monsters like the million spiders in the main office and hope that they would explode or shrivel up or something. And they never did. So I ran through the stock and it always took a while for the school or the janitor or whoever to replenish it. The third suggestion was to create oxygen with water and a DC power source. All I'll say about that is that I shocked myself seven times trying it and didn't get any oxygen as far as I know. But the creativity of all the comments plus the specific premise of that one inspired me to come up with my own idea. If I couldn't find oxygen anywhere else, I would just fart into a bag and use that. As you can tell, it didn't work. But after all of that support and encouragement that you have all given me, I wasn't about to give up. I racked my brain to make the general idea work. And then I had it. 
I found a basketball in the locker room and I stabbed it with a pen. I put my finger over the hole and held my breath. And then when I couldn't hold it any longer, I put my mouth to the hole and inhaled. And this time it worked. At first, during the practice run, and then later when the gas came, I stayed awake. I opened one eye a sliver and looked down to see the unmistakable work boots of the janitor. I was slung over his shoulder. So that's how I get down to the sub-basement every morning, I thought. And that mean guy carries me himself. In my hand, I held the wad of old chewing gum that I had tediously scraped from under a whole lot of desks. I heard a door open, and then we were going downstairs into the basement. I heard the creak of my hatch door open. As the janitor was lowering me in, I opened my eyes under the hair and I took my shot. I stuck the wad of gum into the latch on the hatch door, and then I was on the floor and the door was closing. I waited. I had spent three years in that place, but this felt like the longest wait yet. In reality, it was only a couple of hours, but it felt like forever. Finally, I reached up and I tried the hatch door. It was heavy, but it opened. My trick had worked. The gum had prevented the latch from catching. I crawled out of my hole into the familiar basement that I had seen so many times. There as always was Louis the Lobster pressed up against the wall. Out of habit, I started running the stairs, but something stopped me. It should be morning now. The school should be full of people. The monster should be gone. I walked over to Louis the Lobster and I poked him. I almost laughed. During the day, he was just a dumb costume. But then I thought about what Louis had done to my crush, Robin Phillips. And it wasn't so funny anymore. I grabbed a fuzzy red leg and I tore it off. Take that. I said as quietly as my adrenaline would allow. I tore off another leg. Take that, you crustaceous freak. And then I went for the claws, tearing one of them at the joint, like Louie was a lobster dinner. See you later, Louie. Again, I guess. I felt good until I got to the top of the stairs. Now what? What if Mr. Hillrow saw me out there? Or somebody else was in on it? Was the janitor in on it? During the day, I remembered it. He looked just like a regular person. It was only at night when he turned into a crazy demon thing. The janitor, or so I thought. I needed a distraction. I knew that there was a fire alarm right next to the basement door. I opened the door up, reached over, and I pulled it. As the alarm blared and the lights flashed, I hurried down the hall. Sunlight was pouring in through the windows. There wasn't a wrangler to be seen. After all that time, I walked right out the front door. My car keys were in my backpack, which had been eaten by a giant electric blob in the pool room a year or so back, so I had to walk. I stayed off the main roads and I stuck to the woods. I got scraped up by branches and whatnot, but I didn't even feel it. All I felt was the joy of finally getting out of that school, tempered only by the creeping feeling that it wasn't real, that they would find me that they would hunt me down and drag me back. But they didn't. At least not before I emerged from the woods at the clearing where my house stood. Man, that was a good sight. There weren't any cars in the driveway, which meant that my parents probably weren't home, but that was okay. They would be back, I figured. I lifted the rock on the porch and sure enough, the spare key was still there. I stuck it in the door and I opened it up. As I went in, I got the sense that something was off. It took a while to hit me, but I finally got it. All of the pictures of me were gone from the walls. I hurried up the stairs and swung open the door to my room. And it wasn't my room anymore. There was a desk there and a bunch of bookcases overflowing with books. I sat down in the office chair, my head spinning. Okay, I thought. I should have expected it. After all, Jason hadn't remembered me, and neither had any of the other kids. Even if they didn't know me by sight or from school, they should have at least heard of my disappearance. 
So, I should have expected my existence to have been somehow erased from the outside world. I had no idea how or why, but I knew that it had been. I stood up on weak knees and started pacing the room, trying to figure out what to do. If my parents didn't remember me, then what? But they had to remember me, right? Christ, I had lived with them for 16 years. As I was pacing, I saw it on a bookshelf, on top of a row of books. It was the name written in black sharpie that caught my eye. Emmett. I ran over and grabbed it. It was one of those single, burnable CD, DVD cases from back when people used to burn discs. There was a disc in it, but the same thing written on the surface as it was written on the spine of the case. Emmett. I walked it over and I popped it into the computer on the desk. The screen lit up and it asked me for a password. Screw it, I thought, and I typed out Emmett. It worked, and the video started playing. It was a video of me. First, I was cracking up at my joke bit, and then Mr. Hillrow was giving me detention. And then I was in detention. And then I was trapped. And the cameras followed me down every hall and into every room. They recorded my entire first night trapped in that school. And then there was something else. It was daytime again. Mr. Hillrow wheeled a TV into the classroom. Today for class, we will be watching a video. The camera panned across the classroom. All the kids looked relieved. Video days, as rare as they were, always ruled. I heard a hiss and watched as the camera pointed up to the vents, where a green gas rolled in like fog. This was different than the gas that knocked me out every night. That was white. Now the camera was pointing at the TV screen. Mr. Hillrow was standing next to it, wearing what looked like a military-grade gas mask. He turned the screen on. A man in an awful red mask appeared on the TV. The mask was like a horribly distorted human face with no eye holes. The eyes were meant to look like they had melted shut, with one down near a cheek and the other up by the forehead. There was an unsettling ear-to-ear -ear grin, and the ears themselves were bad too. One was only half of an ear, and the other was pointed like an imp's ear. At least I thought it was a mask. When the low, gravelly voice issued forth, I wasn't so sure. Mehmet Emerson does not exist, said the demonic voice in the screen in Mr. Hillrow's class. You have never met him. All memories of him are false. Destroy those memories, for he has never existed. There is no such person as Emmett Emerson. He is not your classmate, and never was. The camera panned back to the students. Their eyes were wide open and glazed over. As one voice, they repeated, Emmett Emerson does not exist. And then the video ended. I was freaked right the heck out. At least now I knew why nobody from school remembered me. But what about my parents? And what was this video doing in their house? I tore through what used to be my clothes closet looking for something. Anything that could help me get a grasp on what was going on. And that's where I found the mask. The same mask from the video. Just as something important was starting to click into place in my mind. I heard a voice behind me. You must understand, son. You were never to be harmed. Only kept locked in. I spun around to see my dad, and all at once it hit me, like I somehow knew it all along. He was you-know-who. I felt dizzy and sick and then puked all over the rug. Dad, you kept me locked up in that school. Why? My dad sighed. I had to. The prophecy was too close to fulfillment and I couldn't let that happen. You were only meant to be captive until the portal fully opened which should actually be any day now. Then, you would take your place by my side. You were never meant to be harmed, and I insisted that you have free reign at night. Mr. Heldrow, you know him as Mr. Hillrow, wanted to keep you in the sub-basement all this time, but I wouldn't allow it. Not my son, not my Emmett. 
My dad gave a nice fatherly smile when my mind spun like crazy. Prophecy portal. My place by his side. What in the world? But still, there was one thing that I knew for sure. That school had done bad things. It had taken my buddy Jason and who knows how many others. Why did anybody have to go in that place? I asked. You got rid of them, didn't you, Dad? Or you knew that they would go? My dad sighed again. The school must be fed, son. At least until the portal is fully opened. What portal? I asked. It will all be clear soon, son. Until then, I'm very sorry. It breaks my heart, but I must bring you back to school and you must stay in the sub-basement. Not for long, but it's what must happen. I couldn't believe it or process it. My knees were weak and I felt on the verge of passing out. And that's when I saw him come up behind my father. It was the janitor there in my house, with his spiked head and the white absence of eyes. Come on now, bub, said the janitor reaching out to me. It's time to be getting back. So that was it. I was going to live the rest of my life in that dang high school. I closed my eyes and felt that familiar warmth spread out across my body once again. And then I heard a bang that made my ears ring. I thought that I had heard a thunk, but I wasn't sure. I slowly opened one eye and looked down to see the janitor lying face down on the floor, with a hole oozing from the back of his head. I watched in amazement as his body shriveled up, and then blinked out into nothingness over the course of a few seconds. I looked up and I saw my mom standing there, pointing it at my dad, who had his hands up in the air. Now, now, Faye, take it easy, said my dad. Faye, my mom, reloaded. Wait, I shouted. I didn't know at the moment whether I wanted my dad gone or not. I didn't know much of anything at that moment. Please tell me what's going on, mom. My mom lifted it up and brought the butt down on my dad's head. He slumped to the ground. Come on, she said. Help me tie him up and get him to the car. We have to hurry. It'll be dark soon. I still don't know everything and I can't tell you everything that I do know, at least not right now. But I'll try to sum up what my mom told me as we drove around town like crazy and gathering up supplies. While my dad sat unconscious and tied up in the back seat. I'll fill that in with a few things that I've learned since. A couple hundred years ago, my parents were on the run from the law. They hid out in the woods in the place that would later become Claremont, Maine, and built their cabin near the spot that would later become the high school. One night, while they were outside cooking dinner over the fire, they saw a strange glow coming out from under a rock. They rolled the rock aside and all of a sudden, they heard voices in their heads, telling them things. They had found the portal. At the time, it was tiny, like the size of a quarter. I don't know if it was a portal to a different universe, or just someplace far away in our own. I do know that it was a portal to some horrible place, full of bad things trying to make their way to our world. The voices in my parents' head told them that if they helped nurture the portal, and eventually open it fully, they would be granted a mortal life and unimaginable powers. The voices said that my parents must build a structure around the portal to house the creatures that, one by one, would come through it every night. And those creatures must occasionally be fed. And if they did this, over the course of hundreds of years, the portal would become larger and larger, until one day it would finally open wide, and the barrier between worlds would dissolve completely in an instant. That is, unless the prophecy came true. That was me. I was the prophecy. The firstborn son would place the object into the portal, closing it permanently. At some point, the Haldros came wandering through the woods. My dad was wearing that creepy red mask, doing some kind of ritual when the Haldros found him. They were on some kind of crazy missionary work, looking to set up a school of God's highest word and devotion. My dad pretended to be the devil and duped them into building and maintaining the school for him. They were all too happy to help, believing that they were doing the Lord's work, and getting immortality too. That's how it started. For hundreds of years, my parents avoided having any kids, in order to prevent the prophecy from coming true. 
And then they drank a little bit too much one night, and whoops. Here comes Emmett. That's me. The voices told my parents to get rid of me right away. Obviously, they didn't listen. Instead, deciding to watch me carefully. And then one day, they knew that there was no longer any avoiding the truth. The prophecy would come true unless they did something. My mom begged my dad to do nothing, to let the prophecy come true and close the portal. As she begged him, the voices inside her head raged, and she pushed them down. My dad thought there was a way to have it all. All he had to do was keep me locked away until the portal opened fully. But my mom was resolved. She wouldn't let him do that. So my dad did to her what he did to everyone else in that town. He erased all memory of me from her mind. He went around the house and removed all evidence that I had ever been there. And it worked. Until she took one look at me, standing there in my old room. And it all came flooding back to her. And that's when she took out the janitor. We pulled up in front of the school. It was dark out, but I hope that the monsters weren't out yet. I hope that they were still on the other side of the portal. If they were out, we were in trouble. We took the keys from my dad and headed in. I couldn't believe that I was going back in there after just getting out, but it had to be done. We walked slowly through the building, checking for monsters, and we lucked it. They weren't out yet. Then, we were in front of the janitor's closet. In the three years that I had been locked up there, that was the one door that I never opened. It was always locked and there was always this green light coming from the crack under the door. That's where the portal was. Are you ready, honey? Asked my mom, pointing at the door. I nodded, stuck the key in, and swung it open. We were too late. A big hole of crackling green energy was suspended in the closet, getting larger by the second. A wrangler was just crawling out of it, reaching its horrible tentacle arms, feeling for prey. My mom fired but missed the head, and then the wrangler had her, wrapping her neck and her arms and her legs. Mom, I shouted. Do it, Emmett, she gasped. Quickly. I turned to do it, but there was already another wrangler there, and before I could think, it had me. We weren't going to make it. We were going to get our faces taken like Jason. I felt the wrangler squeeze me in a dozen different places, pulling me closer, and I closed my eyes. I love you, Mom, I said. I love you. My mom whispered with what sounded like her last breath. And then I felt the wrangler's grip loosen, and I opened my eyes. Standing there with a huge butcher's knife in each hand was Miss Hadley, a.k.a. the lunch lady. Right behind her was Lily, but she only had one knife because she only had one arm. They were hacking away at the wrangler that had begun ready to attack me. Nasty old things, said Miss Hadley. Aren't they, Lily? Yes, ma'am, said Lily. I reckon they would make a fine stew, though. I had one chance. I pulled the object from my pocket, but I still called it what got me in trouble in the very beginning. I shoved it, still dressed in its tiny glasses and tiny necktie, into the crackling green hole. There was a terrible shriek unlike anything I had ever heard. The portal grew massive and bright for a second, and then shrunk away into nothingness. It was gone. I looked over to my mom and saw the wrangler shrivel up and disappear. She was in rough shape but alive. I slumped to the ground in relief. We had done it. We had closed the portal for good. I wish I could call that the end, but it's not. There are portals like this all over the world. Once the portal at the high school closed, the voices in my dad's head lost most of their power. He can't believe that he locked me in that school. But it wasn't him. And it took a whole lot of willpower just to keep him from attacking me. The voices are still there, whispering echoes from other portals. We're going to find them and close them all. But now that the strongest voices are gone, my parents have also lost their immortality. I really shouldn't be posting this at all, but I couldn't leave you all hanging, thinking that I was still stuck in the school. After this, I do have to go in the DL for a while, so this will be my final update, at least for the foreseeable future. I do have one more thing to tell you. 
We're on our way to meet up with another team. There's a kid there. You might know him as Calvin Dunlop. He posted his story here a few months back. Apparently, the groups that he's been fighting have been deep in this whole thing too, so we're teaming up. Calvin wants you to know that he's doing just fine. He wishes that he could update you, but it's too dangerous. I know it's dangerous, but like I said, I had to get this last one out to you. Calvin says that you guys are the best, and I agree. You guys gave me the courage and hope and creativity I needed to get out of that nightmare. And if I hadn't, and that portal had fully opened, well, that probably would have meant the end of the world. So, you guys literally saved the world. Thanks. Thanks.